Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, May 22nd, 2019 workshop of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Our third and final workshop uh, to review the draft comprehensive plan. Um, before we get going tonight, um, just a sort of overview of expectations. So we're, we're going to go through um, some of the changes that we've all discussed in the prior two workshops, um, the appendices, um, as well as the recommendation for implementing um, or, or evaluating the recommendations for implementation of uh, the various aspects of the plan. So that's our agenda for tonight. Um, Council Gabrielson was not here um, last week, had submitted some things that we did talk about last week. Um, I'll give you an opportunity just a second to make a couple additional comments you want to make. Um, Councillor Penny Jordan will be here momentarily, um, and Councillor Caitlin Jordan will not be with us tonight. So um, there's nobody here from the public uh, with any public comment. Uh, is there any, before I go to Councillor Gabrielson, is there anybody else that has any questions just about the plan or format for tonight? Maureen, anything you want to add before we get going? I just have my little six points, but I, let me Why just... don't we do Councilor Gabrielson first then, and then we'll turn it, turn it over to you. Thanks. Go ahead. Jimmy. Yep. Um, yeah, and apologies for not being able to make it last week. Um, I uh, appreciated the discussion that you guys had. Um, one thought that I had, uh, two quick thoughts that I just wanted to share, um, one relative to affordable housing. Um, on the regional coordination portion of the plan, uh, we are currently having discussions at the uh, GPCOG level with the uh, um, uh, Metro Area Coalition about regional strategies for meeting affordable housing needs in the region. Um, I expect that there will be a draft uh, resolution that will come from that group um, and be presented to all of the councils um, in June. But uh, I just wanted to note that that might be one area where uh, we could consider incorporating a strategy of working with uh, GPCOG and, um, and or the Metro Region Coalition to address some of the regional affordable housing needs um, even beyond what we might do just in town. Um, and the other um, comment that I just wanted to make was uh, I appreciated all of the discussion last week around um, construction and teardowns and then some of the discussion of the electric charging station and how that relates to other broader goals that we might have for the town uh, with regard to sustainability. And one of the thoughts that I had was, I don't know if this is something that necessarily fits neatly within any one of the chapters, but um, I would probably think of putting it mostly in the future land use chapter, um, is a strategy to look at or evaluate um, our current uh, building code standards as they relate to energy efficiency. Um, if we are in fact seeing more teardowns and rebuilds, uh, that would be a great opportunity for us to make sure that when those buildings get rebuilt, they're gonna meet modern energy efficiency standards. I haven't honestly evaluated the ordinance closely enough to see how close we are to, to the mark on that, but uh, this might be a good time to just flag that as an issue to pay more attention to. Thank you for that. Um, any questions on Jeremy's comments or anybody want to add anything? <clears throat> All right. Seeing none, Maureen. Thank you. Yep. So uh, just to remind you, because I know you are pretty much up to your necks in this now, um, that this is the committee's plan and it needs to become your plan so you can make any revisions you need to make to it. Uh, we are going to be submitting this for state certification, so there is a lot of information in here that we're putting in in order to meet those requirements. Uh, there, this is the basis, the legal foundation for our land use ordinances, and so there are things in here that are recommended in order to support those. Uh, the or plan is organized as was chosen by the Comprehensive Plan Committee. I, I truly appreciated Chair uh, Garvin's comments about existing land use, not preceding future land use, because I did make that mistake for months. Um, and we are still using comparison communities of Cumberland, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Scarborough, South Portland. And again, I think we've talked about the limitations of the data, so I won't go any further. Um, any questions before I start in on Appendix 1? Okay, so Appendix 1. Oh, and you have, packet, you have a package in front of you tonight. That's addressing uh, 
the item under revisions on your agenda. So I wasn't going to address that except for one exception until we get to that. So Appendix 1 is the, the public opinion survey that was done for uh, the Comprehensive Plan Committee. They, they uh, went out, we went out for requests for proposals. We got a number of proposals. I think there were seven people who submitted proposals. The committee interviewed, I, I think it was at least two, I think it was four, and they selected RKM, which is in New Hampshire. Um, and they were originally going to do a telephone survey and then shifted gears with this um, online survey. And I know there was um, a question last week about um, how how participatory the survey was, how useful. And I did want to go back and note that when the town adopted its 1990 comprehensive plan, you had a mailed survey to all the residents of the town, I believe it was all the residents, and you based your plan on 118 responses. Um, in 2005, you had a telephone survey, and that was a statistically valid survey of 300 randomly selected people for responses. So the current survey is just under 800 responses, and I will leave it up to you to decide if that is valuable or not. Um, but I did also want to point out that there was a question uh, about how long people stay in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, I'm happy and sad to report that we actually did collect that information in the last survey. And if you go to page one of the appendix, you will see coupled with the question about um, do you own or rent or what is your highest level of education, we did ask how many years have you lived in Cape Elizabeth. So I'll, I will make uh, the appropriate tweaks to the, the text of the document. Um, but we still have a very large number of people who have been here for a long time. 28% of the residents residents who responded to the survey had lived here for more than 25 years. And then um, another 33% have lived here for 11 to 25 years. So a very large percentage of people come to Cape and they stay here. Um, and that is important or not. Uh, I guess some of the other highlights. Um, you know, talks about why people choose Cape Elizabeth. And some of the themes you'll see is people, their highest rating for coming here is open space, quality of life, proximity to Portland. Um, people actually in this survey supported more residential development. Now, it was a narrowly supported, but the fact that it was even narrowly a majority is um, pretty amazing, because usually there's a visceral and significant resistance to any development. And then in that, that answer of more, I would think it was like 51% supported more residential development. If you look a little closer at what they supported, about 50% of the people who said they support more residential development also said they'd supported non-single family type development, such as multifamily and condominiums and apartments. So I think that's also significant. The last comprehensive plan uh, looked at the demographics of the town and said maybe we need some more diversification of housing and there were changes in the ordinance that kind of tra tracked people a little closer to multifamily housing and it looks like that was the appropriate thing to do because it looks like people are supporting that idea that we should have some options to single family homes. Um, we asked about affordable housing, and the majority said, yeah, there's not enough affordable housing. Interestingly, they said that uh, they think we should, if you, who, who should we target our more affordable housing to? They said young families or everyone. So um, also interesting. And um, the commercial development, there were two questions on that. Uh, what respondents said is they support more commercial development, but they want it in the existing commercial districts. They don't support expanding the existing commercial districts. So, and then finally, on page 14 of the report, uh, there's the big 10-year plan question. And that's the question that talks about, so what do you think we should be focusing on in the next 10 years? And the answer is the number one thing that people value is environmental quality, and the number two is supporting agricultural policies. Um, the things that seem to have the least amount of support are 
public transportation, increasing recreational facilities, and increasing park facilities. So again, there's this, we love our parks, we think they're wonderful, we, that's why we come here, but not really thinking that we have a deficiency in that. So I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions. Any questions on that? Go ahead, Chris. I think earlier in the appendix, I'm looking for the page. I don't see it. I think it says that less than a majority actually support um, additional residential development. Ah, there it is, page 17. Yes, in the back they said that, but in the actual respondents, um, it actually says it's surprising that they actually would support more residential development. And Let's see if I can find that. Residential development on page nine. Um, we have strongly support more is 30, 13%. Moderately support is 36%. Uh, while 42% strongly or moderately oppose residential development. So it's a slight, it's just a slight positive four, which is amazing because usually residential development is a visceral response. Any development is a res is res it's just a huge no. So I, I, uh, I apologize. Are you, is it in the slide deck? Or, uh, it's on page nine. So of we've the got appendix? Of, it's yeah, in appendix yeah. one. It's a survey response and it's page ah. one of that report. Got it. So again, it's under half uh, support. Right, right, but right. it's okay. more support than opposed, again, which is just amazing. If you ever looked at any other survey in Cape, it's always Fair enough, but huge. But less than half of the town supports more. Just okay. agreed, that's what the statistic says? It says 49% strongly or moderately support, and we also have 9% that are unsure. There was another, I don't remember where it was in here, there was another section involving commercial development. It goes to the point that you made about how people support more commercial development but in the existing zones. Page 11. Page yes. 11, perfect. Again, another very, I actually was really, as the planner for this town, I was so proud of this answer because I thought, you know, they nailed it. And I can get into that. I don't, I didn't highlight it, but there's a section in here that I just, uh, there was a sentence that I thought was unfortunate that should be removed where it basically said, it tried to reconcile those two and I totally agree with your reading of it, but there was a sentence that basically uh, said something along the lines of uh, the people of the town are confused in order to reconcile the, the two things. and I. I thought that was an unfortunate sentence. So wherever that is, it, I think it should be struck. It so. would be, um, I can try to do that, but this okay, report was yeah. approved by the committee and we have paid can our consultant. the word confused. Okay. But, yeah. anyway, is it near the end? I don't remember where it was. Yeah. It's on page 11. Page 11? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I still don't see it now. <laughs> it is page 11. It's the, it's the paragraph, paragraph just These above the graph. Don't support new commercial, but either oppose or are confused. Yeah, it was that. That was the part that I was like, eh, that's, that's but anyway, <coughs> if it's stuck in there, it's, it's in there. I can, I can see about getting that removed. Because yep. I think it's easy to reconcile it, as you noted, by people do support it, but in the existing zones. Mm -hmm. yep. I can use whiteout. <laughs> I had a question. Um, on the residential development pages nine and 10. Yes. Th there's a footnote in both these charts that says figures may not sum to 100 due yes. to rounding, mm -hmm. but the two bar graphs sum to significantly more than 100. 136. <laughs> or 145 I like, in the case of the one on okay. page 10. So were people, did, were they able to indicate two choices or so is there some overlap in this or? I, I have to assume that's what okay. happened. I so the, the other observation I have looking at that then is that on the demographics of for whom residential development and, and uh, either lower cost or affordable residential development should be targeted to, 
young individuals and young families collectively equals 52%. I think one could reasonably extrapolate that young individuals sometimes turn into young families as well. So um, it seems like, and then, and then with senior citizens and empty nesters grouping those together, it, it seems like there's some clear clusters here versus the observation that anyone is the sort of second second in the leaderboard there, if you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do I do see what you're saying, um, but when we go, and this is much, in my opinion, this, this public opinion survey is much more representative than the results we got from the public forums that we mm -hmm. held, but and I, the public forums actually track the same kind of answers, where when you ask people to make choices, lots of times they say, no, we want everyone. Um, you know, you ask them what kind of open space should be a priority, and they're like, we want it all. So that's why, mm -hmm. but I, I do take your point. Then the, another question I had separate from that in the 10 year plan, the, um, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but the way the answer reads on increased park facilities, I'm just trying to parse whether or not that is create more parks or make the facilities at existing parks better, enhanced, improved, what I have, think you know. where it said, well, above it, it says increase recreational facilities. So that to me would be actually make more of what we have. And then increase park facilities would be, yeah, we should make more parks. Okay. And neither one of them, as you can see, scored terror as a high priority. Right. But so re real life example, I, I, I'm, what I'm trying to discern is invest in Fort Williams, you know, visitor center, restrooms, all the like, you know, that's increasing the facilities there, uh, but it's not adding another park. My, so I, I mean, I can't tell you how people yeah. answered this, but I, my guess, because if you coupled it with the answers people had for Fort Williams, um, it, it seems that people very much cherish what we already have. There's a lot, I mean, so I, I would think maintaining what we have, taking care of what we have, would be consistent with what the people who answered this question that they don't really want us to increase facilities because there are some other questions about should we get more open space should we get more this and and there's there's not that much support for that um, but I I think with this I would guess that people would be fine either even support taking care of what we already have because they've identified it as something they consider very valuable and one of the reasons they moved here. The other thing um, just I found interesting was some of the word thought bubble things. Um, and I'm not sure how to interpret some of those. I, I love that as an exercise because I think it really crystallizes concepts. But at the same time, there's a couple of examples where you see similarly weighted things <coughs> bubbling up that are diametrically contradictory to one another. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and there are, I mean, there were discussions about trying to get people to make trade-offs. And that's where you get the most interesting information. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of opportunities to do that. Right. The other thing you have to be careful of when you're looking at some of these word clouds is they're influenced by what's happening at that point in time or what even was the immediate prior question they were asked. So um, there was like, is what do you think of something right near the end? And a lot of people just repeated the statement from the immediately preceding question, which was use Fort Williams to generate income. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the questions were supposed to be mixed up when people were being asked them, but you still kind of have to wonder because those are right next to each other. Um, I think you need to take the word clouds um, for what they're worth, they're, they're really interesting. You, you get a good snapshot. They're not statistical. Um, if you look, you know, when we get into Appendix 2, I think you'll start to see some of the same words over and over again, and then they start having a little bit more weight. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other thing that I'd point out, both on the word clouds and on the 10-year plan responses, you know, I, I would just note 
the dark blue bar on the 10-year plan is strongly support. The lighter blue bar is moderately support, and every item on the list was supported by a majority or a very large majority of respondents. So, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of reading these more as an expression of values than necessarily the particular policy choices that people would necessarily support. We like parks. What do you want to do about it? Well, that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, and, and that's kind of what I look at these and see in them. I mean, that is a good point. I mean, these surveys are great, but they're no replacement for decision makers. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Ready to go to Appendix 2? Anybody have any questions on the um, 17 and 18 is sort of a summarized key findings? Anybody have any questions on that? No? Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so Appendix 2 is basically a summary of the different public participation efforts that the committee engaged in. Um, they did hire a public participation consultant. I think we had two proposals. They interviewed both. Honestly, they were both really good candidates. The committee chose the one that actually ended up having more technical ability, and that made it possible for us to do some things that we wouldn't have been able to do in an, if we had gone the other way, which probably would have been equal great. So uh, the committee sent out a public, uh, just a press release, uh, then they showed up at the Strawberry Festival and had a couple of big boards up that's like, you know, I wish our town had, or what do you love about Cape Elizabeth, and that's that big word bubble on, let's see, on page 288, and I'm just going to point this out because um, as a planner, I love seeing the big word sidewalks. Um, but the reality is that that word just keeps coming up, and I think you'll all start to see that it's uh, it wasn't just that day. Um, so, okay, so here you have it. So the, the, the next thing the committee did, and this is where we really got help from our consultant, is we established this online public forum. Um, you see all the chapters in the plan. We, as each chapter was completed by the committee, it was posted online, and we asked people, what do you think? And it was an exciting and great tool for a period of time. Um, but at some point, people got tired of looking at the questions, I think they answered, they said everything they wanted to say right in the first six months, regardless of what the question actually was. Um, so what I've given you is kind of like the, the ones that had the biggest answers, but I do want to point out that each one of these questions was moderated by um, a member of the committee. The chapter questions, we got a report summary from our consultant. The specialty questions, the report summary was done by the committee member, and that's why you'll see some variety in the formatting. Um, but the population chapter was very popular. People were very interested in what was going on. Um, the economy chapter was right near the beginning, and there was a lot of thinking about that. Uh, job creation, uh, still near the beginning. And then yeah, we have the transportation chapter and the housing chapter, and then folks started to get a little tired. Um, so you can see how things kind of peter out, but there's still a lot of comments about improving uh, cell coverage. There's comments about sidewalks. Um, there's comments about the town center. And then um, we move to the special presentations. And this was another recommendation of our consultant where uh, we wanted to take uh, in some sense, the comprehensive plan to the community. So we we put a small, there was a small article in the Cape Courier. We posted invites on um, the town website, and I tried to come up with a list of community neighborhood groups, and we don't maintain a list, and those people change all the time. But we sent everyone an email asking if they wanted a presentation, and almost every single member of the committee took this presentation out to the public. 
Councillor Straw had asked at an earlier meeting, where's the list? And I said, oh, it's in the appendix. And I was wrong. But it's in the appendix now. I've included in the pages that I've passed out to you a new page that adds that list. So um, this was really interesting. I did one of the presentations, but all the others were done uh, by the committee. And um, overall, the, the response we heard back was that people were really happy that we went to talk to them. They were really surprised at the information. Um, but there was an effort, I guess, is the takeaway on that. Um, we did a little mini survey called our condominium survey, and that was because we had gotten some pushback at the meeting that people really don't like multifamily housing and people don't really like condominiums and why are we doing this? So uh, we did this survey and it was done all in-house. We got the names of all the condominium owners. We sent out 336 and we got 196 back. So over 50% of the people sent our little survey back. I was pretty happy about that. <coughs> And what we discovered, as I told you before, is just under 40% of the people who are buying condominiums in Cape Elizabeth already lived in Cape Elizabeth. So if you think about if we're building condominiums because we're trying to create housing diversity for our residents, we are somewhat successful. Um, but the other 60% are going, most of them are going to people in the same region. And we, we looked at, you know, other people in Cumberland County. But it's, it is a piece of data for what it's worth. And then we have the public forums. Now, the thing about the public forums is apparently chocolate flavored ice cream is always the favorite. <laughs> um, but we, we, the first forum had about 50 people in it. The second forum, much, much lower, about 12. The third forum had over 60 people. So, um, you know, you can do what you want with the comments of those forums, but it was a very valuable opportunity to reach out to people. We used this keypad polling. Um, that was very popular. People liked doing the voting and they could see um, their results almost immediately. And I think some of the results of the keypad polling are interesting because they sort of track with the public opinion survey. Um, I don't know if anyone had any particular questions. I can tell you that the first and the third forum, we were very fortunate to have significant participation from the high school seniors. And you can be concerned that they skewed the results because they're high school seniors, or you can be, isn't this great that we were able to include a demographic that is almost impossible to get represented in, in, other, in, in other forums. So um, with that, I think that's all I wanted you to have a look at. I don't know if there are any questions about that. I do want to point out on page uh, 320, I can't wait to believe we're on page 320, uh, a question at the last forum, the town should not have growth areas allowing growth to occur without guidance across the town. Um, of the people there, very high disagree or strongly disagree response. So um, not a representative group, but um, interesting question to ask where you have to have trade-offs and people are saying, we, we think we should be managing growth if we have to have it. Are there any questions? The list of community groups, <coughs> didn't you? Wasn't there one help? What I did is that's in this this yeah, I no, sent I, this. I have it here. Right. So what I'm what this is right here is all the comments that you've made in the last two workshops. I've gone into the plan and tried to make all the changes and I printed up the pages that have changes on them. So this was the only one that you had discussed, but there had been a question and I had answered. I just it didn't correctly. know if there was a group missing from the small group community presentations because I thought there was one done in my neighborhood that I didn't see listed here. Uh, all right, I think it's called Casino Beach. Cape Cottage Beach. Cape Cottage, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's on the list, but Don't maybe not. see it, so. Um, yeah, I must have missed it, I will add it. Okay. Yeah, it should be on there. I know a number of people commented to me that they appreciated having the meeting and I, I really liked this aspect of your outreach, the committee's outreach plan, um, because I thought it was a great way to, as you said, sort of take the plan on the road and get people where they are instead of trying to pull people in. So I thought that I thought it was a fantastic element of the outreach plan. So.
questions or comments from folks on this? Chris? Um, the condo survey, that's an excellent response rate. Um, so I just note that. I did want to point out one slide, uh, the one that's entitled, how would you prefer to accommodate future population growth? Only 23% said increased density. So I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Where is that, Chris? Um, I'm looking at the version that's on the website, which is page 311, but it's the underlying so slide deck number three, and then inside of that slide deck, it's slide 14. There's three bars, a gray one on the left, a uh, green one in the middle, yep, and a green. Okay. And the way that I interpret those three bars is kind of, frankly, exactly how I would want the development, which is you develop the vacant parcels that don't increase, the, but you don't touch the density in any neighborhood. And we want multifamily units uh, built in the downtown areas, the way that I would do it. Um, and that's what this response says to me, is that's how most of the town seems to prefer to have it done as well. Other comments, questions? Okay. So I think your next step is the vision statement. And that's, you know, it seems logical that now that you've made it all the way through the plan, that now you can kind of step back for a moment and think about what is the vision for Cape Elizabeth. You've seen all the different data and analyses. You've seen the public opinion survey and the comments. The vision statement that the committee came up with is almost exactly what was in the last plan. It's just slightly revised. sensible for a steady as usual plan. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I said that seems sensible for a steady as you go plan. Yes, <coughs> there you go. That's the executive summary is coming up next. Um, are these in any particular order? They, the committee did discuss the order. It, they're in the order the committee intended. Is that fair, Councilor Jordan? <laughs> It was a long discussion. <laughs> I, I guess I, I, this is, I don't want this to come across the wrong way and I'm not at all, I know how hard this part of the exercise can be. I think the very first half of sentence starts out much more like a vision statement and then it turns into this sort of laundry list. <laughs> exactly. And like, I, I, I you know, it being in the front of the book when we first got them, you know, it was one of the first things I read, and I don't know. I just, I, I it didn't feel as aspirational to me, um, I, and I, I really got kind of hung up on that about you know being a place where families grow and thrive and where you know people, um, you know, live out and enjoy their lives and all that kind of stuff. Like it, it just, it, it just turned into a very perfunctory I think that, list of things that. I think that part of what happened uh, is exactly what you uh, said on the uh, onset of your comment. That type of exercise of creating a vision statement with a large group can be very challenging. Mm. And there were people in the room that uh, were, uh, I would say, leaning toward the more aspirational, you know, let's just get it out there, be succinct and, and not have a laundry list. And then others didn't see their, um, their piece represented in that well, statement. Other, I mean, you, you start to go down here and then <coughs> the list is so comprehensive that you say, well, 
well, what's missing? Exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. And if something is, why isn't it on here? Right. But so. that's, uh, I don't disagree with you, Jamie. I, I, uh, my personal opinion is I would have crafted it differently, but when you're working with a team of people and need to be respectful and representative of everybody's views and input, this is what people could settle on. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of the, my impression. I don't know thank, what it, Thank you for reminding me. There were people who came in with much more overarching proposals. Uh, there were some, there was one, um, Half a page. Anonymous origin proposal, and in the end, the committee was done. This was a compromise. Yeah. Valerie? I would like to propose a radical change to the vision statement. Um, and I appreciate all the work that the committee did putting this together, but I think we as the council should come up with something that's a like I think you said, Jamie, more aspirational. Some of the things that we've talked about, like um, making sustainability a priority and prioritizing climate change, alternative energy, the things that really have jumped out um, from this. I think maybe we should just start from scratch almost with the vision statement. Yeah, sure. I, I, I tend to agree. When I was sitting in, in the seat Marines in now, um, I would always tell the committees I was working with, I, I like to put the vision statement right before the future land use plan, and I'd always tell them, the vision statement is poetry, the future land use plan is prose. This is, to me, is prose. Um, <coughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really capture that aspirational sense of where we want to be heading as a community, even if where we want to be heading is pretty much where we're at, um, I think we could express that um, perhaps better. I like that idea. I agree. I, I think that we need to um, look at this and refocus it. So what would be our best path forward on that, do you think? Well, I mean, one way to do it is for you to knock it out here. Um, if, if that doesn't appeal to you, <laughs> um, I'm taking notes. If you want to tell me what you think it should say, I would be willing to take what you're saying and come back with a draft for you to consider, which might get you halfway down the road. Don't you hate that? Um, I don't, I'm not interested both for reasons of time and um, I, I just don't think it's good, uh, a good, uh, creative exercise to, to try and develop it on the fly here. So, um, I mean, go ahead, Penny. Do we want to? Um, I think a lot of times uh, vision statements can be created if we eat, because we have a similar um, concept of they should be aspirational. If, if we each drafted what we see as a vision statement, and sent them in, and then you're going to find similarities, I think, a lot of similarities, and that we then use those as a, a straw to uh, create, because otherwise you're sitting in a room talking about them yeah. versus putting them in writing. What I would suggest is, um, <laughs> I, 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 I like that idea, maybe just a slight variant on it, is, you know, I mean, some people, are better writers than others. Some people are more comfortable with that exercise, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to put pressure on anybody to, to come up with, um, you know, the preamble to the Constitution with, you know, with, if they're not comfortable with that. Um, so if, if you're not interested in drafting sort of a narrative paragraph like this, but have even just a few key words or turns of phrase that are of interest, um, like I just threw out about, you know, a place where families grow and thrive and stuff like that, um, then at the very least I'd, I'd request everybody put that together. And if you want to go further than that, to actually draft a full statement or paragraph, um, then all the better. And I mean, when we came up with a vision statement for Fort Williams Park, I think one or two of us at the, on the council at the time Right. Sort of had that as a task and came back with something that was, a, you know, a foundational paragraph for us to work from, and, and we kind of finessed it from there. So I think I think taking that same approach will work here. Um, 
I would encourage us to just think about it less in terms of um, using this vehicle to actually sort of commit to specific policy stuff versus think about the broad outcome that those policies help achieve. Um, so um, even where you were starting to go, Valerie, and I'm not, I'm not picking on you or singling you out, but just because you gave the example of thinking broadly about having a sustainable community and not necessarily getting down to the level of, well, what are we going to do to make that happen? Because the rest of the plan is what accomplishes that. But st stating the sort of the bold goal and objective of we want this to be the type of community that we have, then the other parts of the plan are what sort of helps to, to hold that up and support that. So, Because I think otherwise we'll get back into this place where we're bullet pointing out different tactics and stuff like that. So, Penny? So do we want to identify a couple of people that we send these to and they can then uh, merge them together or come up with something or so that uh, we got to send them to somebody who's going to mm -hmm. nice. pull together the process. I'm going to send mine to Jeremy. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are the, is, does anybody want to take the lead on it? I'm, <laughs> I, I'm glad to. If people want to take <laughs> ideas, I, will, I can collect them all, keep them in a document, and, and come up with a, a, a first attempt at a synthesis, and we can put it on an upcoming agenda or for a workshop to you know, revise it from there. Okay. Glad to, glad to do that. I love it when people volunteer. Like, <laughs> Make sure you're just, just for, you know, rules of, of communication and stuff like that, make sure you're just sending them to Jeremy, not floating them around to everybody. Um, we don't want to be going back and forth on um, commenting on them and stuff like that. So if you forward them to Jeremy, he can use them as source material to, to come up with something that they will, we will then all review at a future meeting. Great. Okay. Like that. Thank you. I was getting nervous. Um, <laughs> and again, uh, I just want to emphasize, as others have too, that um, and appreciate Maureen and Penny both the context of how this was arrived at, and it's not intended in any way to um, denigrate the the work that was done or or um, diminish um, uh, diminish that in any way, but. Um, I'm sure coming at the end of the process too, it, there was a fatigue factor as well. So, um, and I think also, frankly, probably difficult in so much as there was one that was being referenced from, you know, from the current plan uh, that might have been hard to break away from. So, um, any other remaining comments on this? Okay. Um, just to tie off on that, for timing, um, <coughs> do we yeah. want to, I, mean, I think best to act on this while it's sort of fresh, yeah. and so if you can get stuff to Jeremy like within the next week, that would be ideal, um, if at all possible. And then will we put this on our gym workshop? I think that that makes sense. I think uh, staff have talked about the need for you potentially to have a June workshop after your public hearing on the yeah. comp plan for cleanup amendments, and that might be a great time to focus on a vision statement. Okay. And that, that workshop's not currently scheduled. Right. Okay. That's that? We're just talking about the uh, you referencing the public hearing on June 10, and then having a workshop immediately following that. Um, I, I mm -hmm. just meant sometime after June 10. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think yeah. meant literally yeah, yeah, yeah. that June 10. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So if there's nothing else on that, should we slide into revisions? Yes. So as Maureen said, we've got a stapled packet that everybody's um, seen here. Um, and if you saw her email earlier, um, a number of the revisions have resulted in repagination um, based on things shifting around and so on. So 
Do you want to just go through? I'm assuming, yeah, let's, okay. I, I'm, I can go as fast or as slow as you want. Um, but on page eight, there were just a couple of um, typos on line seven and eight. No problem with that? Okay, so the next one would be page 23, where um, a brand new <coughs> recommendation uh, deals with the uh, old data and the imminent U.S. Census. And the goal has been drafted that the town shall review the 2020 U.S. Census data with a focus on data for the town of Cape Elizabeth as it becomes available. And then the recommendation, the action step is identify trends in the 2020 U.S. Census municipal data that substantially diverge from data and projections included in the 2019 Cape Elizabeth Comprehensive Plan. So basically, I mean, we're thinking this is a staff level review and if things are, you know, if we said 50 and it went down 30, it's not really that significant, but if we're saying the trend is this way and the data is going this way, that's when we should be more concerned. Good. Everybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Chris, if you're not. I act, obviously, I prefer to fix it right now, but uh, I'm in the minority. It is what it is, so. What do you mean, fix it now? The population chapter, um, as, I, as I demonstrated yeah. with my draft, the population tra chapter is objectively wrong. The facts it's based on are objectively inaccurate. I thought I did a pretty good job of spelling that out and presenting the updated data. I would just fix, it would be one thing if we were under the gun and there was a need for us to pass this immediately in order to uh, make sure our ordinances continue to have the benefit of the doubt with the courts or whatever it is. But we're doing this project a couple years ahead of time. Um, and someone asked the question at one of the original meetings, why are we doing this right now? And the town planner said, well, I didn't ad necessarily advise you guys to do this. The town council said to do this. But was, what was left unanswered was why are we doing this now? What town councilor actually requested that we do this now? Are they even still on the town council? Uh, I still don't know the answer to that. I don't know why we're doing this now. But the point being that if we're not under the gun and we have time, why don't we just fix it? Or otherwise, just wait till we get the updated data. We can put this aside, get the updated data, and then make it uh, reflect the comprehensive plan uh, so that it's, it's indeed accurate. But if everyone wants to continue, continue moving forward, I recognize that uh, I'm beating a dead horse and I'm probably in the minority here, so I'm gonna stop beating the dead horse. Other thoughts? This is something that can be amended, correct? That's my understanding? Yes. And also the 2020 census data we won't have until 2022, 2023? Is that yeah, typical? Yeah, and, and you know, honestly, we're not even sure what the census is gonna collect for data right now. So yeah, probably, I'm guessing, I think um, Councillor Garvin had said 18 months. I thought that was reasonable and, you know, things. I think, I think there will be a baseline of information that will be released and then there will be more levels of data depending on how much, more, how much they collect and, and that's still under discussion. So we, it could be 2022, 2023 before we receive any of the data from the census. We don't, we don't even know. Uh, so is it something that we want to um, look at right now or is it something that we want to wait um, four years to amend? I guess that's the question you're asking. Um, I, I guess the, the third option <coughs> is um, and I, I, don't, I don't know if it would be something that would be included in the body of the plan or as, a, as some sort of appendix, but would be to represent both sets of data and both sets of facts as we 
as we have them now um, and have some sort of indication that, you know, the recommendation of the committee and the plan that they presented to us was based off of this. Uh, an alternative set of data yields this conclusion and the town and the, you know, policymakers and so on, you know, could consider both uh, as they move forward. I, I, I'm not really in favor of waiting. Um, and to go back to your question of um, sort of how did this start, um, so, you know, the council as a whole, uh, whenever, th two and a half years ago, um, obviously would have had to vote on and for, you know, form the committee. Um, I don't honestly specifically know um, if it was, I believe, Chair McCausland at the time that, you know, just would, would have been um, organizing the agenda at the very least and working with um, previous manager McGovern on that um, to get it started. Um, but regardless of sort of who whose bright idea it was, I mean, the council as a whole voted as, that it was something to do. Um, I think I remember it being part of our goals one year. Um, so it would have come up through that process as well. Um, while there was nothing sort of in our previous plan that was, and, and circumstances sort of on the ground haven't changed to the degree that it was um, necessitating an update, you know, based on economic or demographic conditions or anything like that, as, you know, Maureen had indicated, you know, good planning practice is to update it, you know, sort of within the interval that we're in. We just happen to have chosen the wrong side of 2020, probably, um, to have that be the most productive in terms of available data. Is that a decent characterization, what do you say? Um, you know, so as we go for different programs and things like that, or, uh, you, you know, and, and part of the criteria is, well, do you have a current comp plan, and is that up to date, and all that kind of stuff, then obviously you know, doing this work, um, you know, is favorable to us as far as that's concerned. Um, but as a data collection exercise, um, it's admittedly flawed. In, uh, <coughs> where it has to rely on some older data points, um, you know, for part of the findings. Penny? A couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, um, Chris, I don't uh, agree with setting this aside because I think out of this work came some really important things that uh, was, were not represented in our current comprehensive plan. Um, I think that it, it brought us into more current thinking uh, about how uh, technology needs to be leveraged in our, our community, H how we need to start addressing some of uh, the um, diverse housing needs, how, we, you know, just some of the things that we, we didn't have. But then my really naive question is, what are the implications if we incorporate the work that Chris has done in this document, because I, having gone through this and having been part of the process, I don't think it significantly changes any of the um, uh, the, the goals and the, the strategies. Do you? And honestly. Uh, it, uh, d let's, if, if we were to say there was 100 goals in strategies, it affects maybe 10 of them. So yes, in, the vast majority are. Uh, the, so uh, for example, um, and you can see how it all fits together. Uh, if you look at the argument for why we should decrease minimum lot slot size in existing uh, developments and why we should allow larger homes to be uh, turned into multi-unit housing, the argument to justify it, uh, if I recall correctly, is that it's in order to create create uh, more living spaces for older residents so that they can downsize within the community as opposed to leaving the community. 
Um, that's part of the argument, and the argument is rooted on the, uh, the belief that the uh, older demographic has increased like 50% or something like that. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look at the data, it shows that the oldest demographic actually hasn't changed. It's been statistically, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that, I, I'm just pointing out the most yeah. obvious one. Yeah, you go can ahead. See. Um, yeah. So there's, there's just one, and instead, uh, when I look at the data, it says actually what was in the survey of the public, which is, the younger generation, basically, the, the argument is during the Great uh, Recession, people stopped having kids, but they didn't choose to just not have kids. They simply delayed when they're having children, and now they're having children, so we're having a local mini boom. So all of that group of society wants to move into town, and they need housing. So you're absolutely right that it's still we need housing, but it's the which demographic do we need to build it for? And that's what the survey also indicated it. What we should be looking for is it was the we need more housing uh, at the moderate income level on the lower end of the age spectrum. So, but we already I, yep. know that. Oh, I, I totally okay. agree. But um, so the comprehensive plan needs to reflect that that should be our growth priority is that demographic. It shouldn't be used as the justification for altering the existing. Uh, areas of town. And I'm just using this as one example. Okay. But my point is, I, total, I, I ultimately completely agree with you that 90% of the comp plan isn't ultimately affected by this, which is why it just seems like, I'm like well, just fix it. Um, but I understand just fixing it takes time. Um, but it isn't a huge amount of time. But that's my point is we're not under the gun. So just fix it. it, it if but if we take the, um, the, the, the scenario that when 2020 census data becomes available, we will kind of look at that and overlay it, you're going to come out with the same outcome that you and I, we just talked about, is if you incorporate this. Yes, yes, yes. So yep. e either yep. way you have the same outcome, correct? Uh, roughly, yes, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm in agreement you with you. That was my point. <laughs> we're on the same. We're on the same. We're, we're, I think we're in complete agreement. It's we the, are. It, it, which it's is like why either now or later. Yeah. So. The other thing, um, just parenthetically, as a data point, um, I don't have it right at my fingertips, but just in the past week since we've been doing this, um, these workshops, I know that there was um, some data that was released about the birth rate being like generationally low, right, like currently, or, or within, I guess it would have been within the last two years. And so what I think is that the truth on all of this is probably somewhere right in between, where there might be a little bubble coming, but then it might again flatten out or decline or all that kind of stuff. So. And I apologize, we are going a little yeah. field, but you're going into my wheelhouse of things I love mm -hmm. to look at all the time. Uh, the reason for my reading of the data why we're seeing that gener uh, generationally low amount, if you actually break it out based on the age groups, it's because the 15 to 17 year olds aren't having kids, which is great for society. Instead, it's people are having the most, so you, you see this huge drop in uh, uh, fertility rates amongst young kids. Uh, that's not a group that traditionally in Cape Elizabeth is having children. So yes, we're seeing that across society, but locally we're not impacted by that trend that is impacting that subset of the age demographics. Millennials so, aren't having babies. And, and this is the, the argument is that they will be having babies. They stopped having them during the Great Recession because they were more concerned about finding a job and they couldn't find jobs. And they're like, we don't have the disposable income. And the, so the question became that the, the people are talking about out there is it, have they chosen to simply have fewer children? Children, or is it we're going to have them later in life once we've managed to find jobs and settle down and move out yeah. of our parents' basements? Yeah, so. I don't think we had anything in the plan addressing parents' basements. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should revisit that. That was taking large houses. Accessory <laughs> dwelling. <laughs> Multi units. Um, I think we got to crack this nut here. Well, I thought I heard some some ground being given by Chris on mm -hmm. if at the end of the day, um, when this becomes available, this information becomes available, and should it yield material impact, mm -hmm. that we would adjust anything accordingly. Yeah. Um, was I misinterpreting that, or? Uh, no, you're right. But that was my point: is that. Um, 
I already did just a cut of the first couple pages. Yeah. So my point is that if we adopted that, then we, yeah. it, it's already going to incorporate that. And it's not like I used a different data set than what was originally used. I simply updated it to reflect the 2017 data rather than the 2015 data because the 2015 data had this bizarre outlier for the under fives that threw everything off. And once you take that out and you look at all of the other surrounding years, it's quite clear that was an outlier that threw off all of the statistics. Maureen, do you have any thoughts, sir? All the data that I've received, and I'm not going to argue with someone whose wheelhouse this is, um, says that there was an uptick at one point to take care of the people who delayed during the Great Recession, but then the, it, it upticked, and now it's heading back down. Still, the birth rate. And it's, it's a national trend. I, I, I will be surprised if when the U.S. 2020 date is available that it shows an uptick from you know, what we've experienced for 15 years. You guys have any thoughts? I think the language Maureen's come up with for this revision captures what I'm interested in capturing here, which is basically when we have better data, we'll refer to it and update our decisions then. Yeah, and I agree that we should be aware that there is going to be more data at some point soon that will be more accurate, but I also... I think it was Penny who said this. I, I don't think it really affects the recommendations of the plan. <coughs> so I would be in favor of going forward now, but I do want to keep that additional recommendation in. And I also, maybe I space this part, but could, could we just include Chris's revisions? That's what I, is, I mean, is that a practical solution? To incorporate his revisions? Or to basically have both represented? I, I would be concerned because you basically are including something that in some places is completely different from what you have. You'll have two different positions on some pretty critical information. I remember this population well, I think that that's the point, though. Yeah. So the question to, is... To demonstrate that there are divergent opinions or divergent well, conclusions. I mean, you could do that with every chapter, though. I mean, this document is supposed to represent. Well, I, I think there's, I think there are other pieces. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that there are other examples like that where you have. I think there are many more though where there's consensus opinion. Is my point though? If this committee, if this council wants to include that information, that can be included. I think the question I'm trying to directly ask is: Is there an elegant way to, as I. I think I said, say, you know, this is the conclusion and recommendation that the committee came up with based on the data that they used. You know, alternatively, there is this other data set that would lead somebody to potentially come to this conclusion. I mean, Council and other staff and policymakers, you know, should should be mindful of that and and consider that as they move forward with anything pertaining to this you know, particular chapter. So if you want to let people know that the data is old and you want to, you know, you want to make them aware, I think this goal does that. Mm -hmm. um, we can add a paragraph that supports <coughs> this goal in the body of the chapter that says we know the data is old and that's why we're recommending this. If you want to take the, the verbatim changes that Councillor Straw has made and include them as, say, an Appendix 3, I think that's a problem because you're, you're basically... No, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm more on the former yeah. of, of saying, um, and, and being overt about it, I, I have no problem with about, as you're saying, sort of descriptively, you know, there are some potential risks in using data that is aged like this. Um, some, some of the updated information that we've seen may lead somebody to a different conclusion. When we have fully available data, 
we'll go back and revisit it, which is what you've proposed. I can, is I can add, there? I can go to the, the population chapter and add one or two lines that talks about the age of the data and why it's important to um, look at the 2020 census when it's available. Would that satisfy your concern? Can't you, can't you say that, or can't one say, that, um, that there are divergent data sets and the comprehensive plan team chose to, um, uh, I would say, uh, look more strongly or whatever word at a particular data set. So when somebody goes and reads this case, the comprehensive plan, they can see the divergence and they can uh, then understand why a certain tact was taken through the comprehensive plan. There's one way to do it. I, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm with Chris on this, because if we have current data that is telling a different story about the population of Cape Elizabeth, for me to sit here and say, oh well, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna go with what uh, was sitting here and what was brought through the, the comprehensive plan, I think I'm, I'm doing a disservice to the plan. And so I'm, I'm with Chris, if I've got current data and it's only a variance at maybe, Ten areas, then let's address it now, so we know what direction we're heading. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. So, Councillor Straw, and again, you know, I am, I'm not going to get into the weeds with him on this because I'll lose. But I mean, one of the things that the committee had to look at, and I think you'll remember, is that there was always this desire for more and more and up-to-date numbers, and and we pushed back. Uh, both our, our consultants with GP Cog, because even if the data is available, it doesn't mean it's any good. I mean, some of some of these data points at this point have such enormous error error rates. There, it's just not good data. And even though it says it's 2017 and you're feeling better because it's you know more up to date, it's based on such a tiny sample size. It has almost no relationship to what's going on here. So if you, I mean, we can chase the data down, um, but we're just never going to get anything better until 2020. It's just going to get worse. Uh, I'm going to partially agree with you on that. I do agree with that. Uh, the problem is <coughs> the sample size is such that we have large margins of error. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the state gave us a package of data for the comp plan, and the issue ultimately is the use of the American Community Survey in the comp plan, uh, which in my understanding is that package of data from the state planning office did not include the American Community Survey, and we separately went out, or, or our consultant or someone separately imported this into the document. And it's that set of data that the state did not give us that is the source of the problem. The, the state provides you, by, by law, the state is required to provide communities with data sets. Um, I'm going to try to be very polite and say they have very limited usefulness. <laughs> Every single chapter, um, there was an effort to obtain data that was well beyond what was available in the so-called state data package, which honestly, if I showed it to you, is nothing but a series of links some of which aren't even alive anymore. So um, for the population, the housing, the transportation, and the economy chapter, we contracted with the Greater Portland Council of Governments to collect the best data sets that are available, and it's almost always the US Census. And they do this for lots of communities, and they can do it with an efficiency of scale. It takes them a lot less time than it would take me. In addition, because they're working with this data much more often than I am, they're able to keep track of error rates better than I am. And so we, I did give you a memo, which I asked them to provide when this was discussed at the committee level, that you know we're working with the best data that's available. I mean, I'm not going to pretend and tell you it's great. 
um, but the closer, the further you move away from the 2010 census, the worse everything gets. It just does. Um, and, and, you know, updating uh, 2015 with 2017, there were some points that the committee asked to update because the data was available if you went online, and GPCOG came back and said, yes, but we don't want you to use it because it's just too large an error. So there were places where we deliberately chose to use a 2015 number instead of a 2017 number or a 2018 number because at least the 2015 number had only a 48% error rate. But it's up to you as the council how you want to handle this. Acknowledge the barriers. So, to your point. I think I think um, Councillor Jordan's right. We have to acknowledge it. But I also feel that the committee did a lot of work on this, and they spent a lot of time with it. And I'm not saying that Councillor Straw hasn't also. But it seems that as a group, they put a lot of time into this. They contacted GPCOG. They looked at all of these numbers. And I don't know that I have um, the time or the ability to say that the 2017 is better than the 2015 when they, as a committee, put it all together for us so that I wouldn't have to make that decision. <laughs> Sure. And it sounds like um, they really were thoughtful with it. If it is just a tiny tweak, my recommendation would be to go forward with this and then um, amend once we get our 2020 uh, census results. I think we've all made our opinions now. <coughs> I think if we can be a little bit more declarative in the in the document, um, then that's probably mm -hmm. the consensus that I'm hearing. So, keep moving ahead. Next is some updates to the economy goals. Right, so um, in some cases you gave word for word what you wanted it to say. In some cases you gave me, you know, your sense and I've made revisions. So you really want to review this to make sure it says what you <coughs> want it to say. Goal one is the town shall develop strategies to accommodate tourism while protecting the interest of residents, our parks, open spaces, and neighborhoods. The recommendations under that goal have not changed. I'm going to just keep going unless someone says anything. Please. Under no, no, I said please. Okay, please. under goal two, um, the goal hasn't changed. This is the town center as the primary commercial area goal, and we've added a new. Um, implementation or recommendation that we should develop strategies to start and promote small businesses in the town center district that serve residents. Okay, going to goal four, um, the goal was basically brought up a couple of thousand feet um, to a more generic, the town shall continue to allow businesses in residential areas subject to restrictions that protect the integrity and tranquility of Cape Elizabeth's residential neighborhoods. And then um, a new recommendation was to develop strategies to start and promote small businesses in the business A and business B districts that serve residents. And that should really, that's in the wrong place, I apologize. That should really be under goal number three. Which leaves goal number four without a recommendation.
Can we just go back and see what I'm going to do with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Does everyone see why that doesn't make sense? Yep. yep. Good. Yep. Okay. So, any thoughts? I'm probably I'm going to go back to the old number eight, something that allows, continue to allow stuff to happen in residential areas as long as it's sensitive. Next page would be page 44. Done that one. So now we're going to page <coughs> 48. Um, there was a uh, a request to add more language into the transportation chapter that basically reflected the, the renewed interest in sidewalks. Any comments on that? I'm seeing, okay. Um, Page 50 is um, something you did not receive last night that's in your package in front of you tonight. Uh, I just got this request. There was um, a request to include some specific information regarding some relatively low cost improvements that would improve bicycle safety. So I've put this in here. It talks about some road striping, some stenciling. Um, I think that you are gonna need uh, some public process and a council vote before you make these changes, but you're at least establishing groundwork in the comprehensive plan. Yeah, and, and that's consistent with the types of concerns, addressing the types of concerns I, I was raising with the comment. Okay. Would be page 59, which is reworking the recommendations in the transportation chapter. Um, can we go back to um, it? Follows follows bikeways. There was a paragraph on complete streets, and then uh, the previous page 51 in the original plan was parking. Yeah. Um, should we, do we need to update this now? I know there was a separate section relating to Fort Williams that we were going to update. Right. I think, I mean, I would, again, going back to say it once in one place well, uh, the section, the open space and recreation chapter does focus on Fort Williams and it does talk about ways to generate revenue. So I would say that that should be the place you should be talking about. This section is a requirement of the state um, rule and you have to identify major parking areas and you know Cape Elizabeth doesn't have any major parking areas just like you know a major what do they consider major none of the things I would say parking garages I would say lots very large parking lots um, for example a major employer is defined as someone with 250 or more employees and we don't have a major employer in town so um, the, the best I could do for major parking spaces was what we have here. Again, if you want to put something in, but there was a decision to have all the stuff about Fort Williams in one chapter. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to fuss about it. it, it, it would. I don't, I don't know how closely we're sort of skirting things if, if we're not considering 280 spaces to be major, a major parking facility, but. Well, they're, they are arranged over 98 yeah. acres, so. I mean, I know that that's not the, the singular and primary purpose of the facility, obviously, unlike a garage or a lot like you just described, but um, okay. 
back to where you were on the goals. <coughs> So transportation goals, uh, the first goal hasn't been changed, but uh, the new goal number 13, we've included a reference to the traffic calming policy and update to reflect current technologies and methods. I think that was um, Councillor Jordan. And then our new recommendation 16, make specific improvements for bicyclists and pedestrians in safety challenged areas. That's kind of the recommendation that's backed up by the, the paragraph that was just added. I think that was addressing comments uh, from Councillor Gabrielson. Yes. Uh, so the specific improvements, I was a little uncertain about that. Uh, that is meant to encompass the, uh, the stuff about uh, Full Lane and Mitchell Road and things like that, that's what the uh, safety challenge areas yeah, are. I, I will be honest with you, you know, I, I, I think we've got, uh, I, th I think there's some duplication in some of the recommendations for bicycle and uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, you know, number 15 seems like the broader piece. Um, you want 16, we put 16 in. I, I guess what I was thinking in terms of, of pedestrian improvements, um, I just I I would note that I often walk home after these meetings, and the um, the separation in some places between the pedestrian areas on the short path and the roadway is is minimal, um, and so I was thinking more in terms of ways that you could enhance the safety, not of new sidewalks, but just look at, are there ways to enhance traffic separation, make specific, and, and I think there's probably some evaluation that we need to do before we can identify what those specific safety improvements are, but I think there are a couple of places on our existing sidewalk net network where we could, you know, ask the Public Works to take a look identify some problem areas and see if we need to do anything, if there's anything that we can do to improve uh, really the pedestrian safety is what I was thinking about there. Well, so I mean, to, if I could, so what I think I'm hearing is that the intention of 15 is talking more about expanding and adding and yeah. broadening the network. The intention of 16 is to specifically address safety of existing? Take what we've got and make sure that it's as safe as it can be. So okay. I can make, yeah, that's what I was hearing. I can make some adjustments to that um, so that it clearly references existing network improvements. Because then I also have a question about the redundancy of what is new goal or, or new recommendation number 20 under goal two that seems somewhat duplicative to it that does, as yeah. well. I'm sorry, what were those again? <clears throat> just a little further down than yeah. what is now new recommendation 20 under goal two seems to be similarly somewhat duplicative. Yes, I, I, I would, I would I agree. I think they could be merged somehow. I don't know exactly how. Yeah, the, I mean, number 15 um, talks about Mitchell Road and other collector roads and Shore Road and Shore Road is a collector road and Sparrowink Ave is a rural connector road. So I, 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 when you have your meeting in September and you try to implement this plan, it will be better if you have fewer recommendations and the recommendations don't duplicate each other. So bigger recommendations that have more umbrella and more pieces are easier to act on than to have four or five that all kind of relate to each other because they distract you. You say, oh, I'm not gonna deal with that because I'm working, number 27 is the same as number 14, so we're gonna do number 14, but then number 14 is written kind of narrowly. It's easier to lose things. So I'm hearing you say that maybe you're okay with um, taking number 20 and merging it into number 15? Yes, and I think if 15 is, is focused on looking where we need new stuff and 16 is focused on looking where we can, where we can make what we've got better, that would, I, that's kind of the original point I was trying to address. I'm happy to make those changes. Anything else? Okay. 
And then number 21 is um, taking an exist, this is actually, number 21 is a really great example of taking an existing recommendation and changing it to mean something that you want it to mean. So the original recommendation was really just talking about traffic calming measures in the intersection, Route 77 Shore Road, Scott Dyer Road. This one really broadened it out to say improve safety and really look at more things than just traffic calming. Are we okay with 21? So the next one. Um, is number 63, and um, this was our, I think we'll leave this data in there just because we have it, but this was originally intended because we didn't have the tenure data. Maureen, I just, sorry to interrupt, sorry. I just note there was also a change to um, goal 22 to move the electric car charging infrastructure. Yes, and that's, that's in there now, in, and we deleted it out of the future land use plan section. Good. Yep. So um, the, the assessor put together this data um, and it's just kind of, it has limited use because if you sold, if a house is sold more than two times, um, it can be the same house that's sold over and over and over. It also has limited use because you could have the same person moving from one house in Cape Elizabeth to another house in Cape Elizabeth. It doesn't really show you people moving in and out of town. If you want us to take it out, we can now that we figured out we still have that tenure data, uh, but we did collect it. Any comments? All right, I'm, I'm hearing silence, so I'm gonna move on. Page 77. So the recommendations uh, from the committee included one to <coughs> look at an option uh, style of housing called cottage housing. And um, this was something they kind of added near the end of their process but I did send you um, the PDF of the cottage housing report, which is, you know, I thought really thorough and good illustrations. And you asked for definitions, so I actually built a section that talks about what cottage housing is, it references the section, and then we also include this little illustration from that report that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, so this is just background information for the recommendation to look at cottage housing that's in the goal section. Any questions? Chris? Yeah. There's probably too far afield, but uh, so um, are, are you familiar with Bridgeton at all? I actually wrote a comprehensive plan for Bridgeton. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago, out of curiosity? Now we're really going to feel the first one. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's a new development in Bridgeton that I think is a cottage development, but I don't know. But um, I'm just trying to figure out what, if I think this is, I'm trying to envision, oh, is this a, how do I feel about this? Um, I was hoping you, but I would suggest if anyone's driving through Bridgeton over near the hospital, there's a new subdivision that I think is an example of cottage housing, but I'm not certain. Yeah, I, and I, I am not familiar with any, I haven't seen any examples on my own. Um, I'm not, this seems like really a niche that is only a few people that are, I mean, we're talking about homes that are less than a thousand square feet in size and, you know, being the planner from this community where you so highly value open space, if you really want to keep open space, what you do is you take those thousand square foot units and you push them all together. And then you can really preserve open space. But um, this was something that the committee uh, was excited to try to look at because I think, I really think your last comprehensive plan went a long way of taking advantage of new, new things that still fit within what the community thought it could do and pushed you a little outside the envelope, which is why I think there was some friction and some unhappiness. Um, but there's not a lot left. 
uh, because you kind of did all the heavy lifting in the last plan. This is something that's left. Putting it in the plan doesn't mean you're going to adopt it. It does say that you will at some point put some time into considering it. Yeah, I mean, I think on the on the goal and recommendation, we have very tepid sort of. We'll we'll take a look at this, but I think what was lacking and what this helps to. to fill in the blank for is just what even is it because I don't think that that was sufficient in the previous reference so and you know I could take the picture out if you want but it, once I got I going I, I could <laughs> stop so all right so then we would move to the housing recommendations um, I think we're on page 81 where we just uh, Evaluate options to increase density and related provisions to potentially allow conversion of a large, large single family home into multiple <coughs> units and to allow cottage housing development. So 27 and was combined into one that is that big unit. And then um, the big in Phil Lots, I think you all got that um, memo from yesteryear of the of the review that the town did a couple of times and this is a revision to clarify that it's meant to be vacant lots they're supposed to be existing lots you can't go ahead and create a brand new lot and we did put a floor in that it was only going to increase potentially the buildability of lots that were as small as 5,000 square feet um, so it's not looking at any lot of any size. And again, it's evaluate. It's, it's not saying you're committing to doing it. It's also saying that if you do do it, you are going to have to put the affordable housing requirements on it. And you know, if, you, if you are looking to make those lots build, buildable because you want to promote affordable housing, you do need those requirements. They won't stay affordable on their own. I move on, Councillor Straw? I think everyone knows I'm opposed to that one. Um, and obviously... Even with the provisions? And even with the fact that it's just a value? So, create a hypothetical situation. We have these two lots. Uh, there are two lots that are on the subdivision plan from 1920, whatever. Um, this, the evaluate is the one thing that I'm like, eh, at least it's evaluate, it's not do it. So that gives me a, a little faith that we'll eventually reject it. But if it does pass, you're going to have a situation where you have a random person sitting there in town. This property's been the way it's been for 100 years. They have no intention whatsoever of putting anything on this lot. Uh, but the town assessor is going to have to come in and he's going to have to accurately assess that property. And before this chunk of land was worth it, it's just extra lot on the front of their lot before it was worth that, maybe $10,000 in their assessment. It's now a billable lot. That's not, if he has to accurately assess it, can he still assess it at $10,000 or does he have to assess it at $200,000 or $250,000? So that landowner now has a situation where they were paying at what, uh, 10,000, they're paying maybe 100, $200 a year in property taxes. That lot that they had no intention of developing they now have to pay 2000 a year in property taxes. So pro and con, but their, our property tax base goes up, we bring in more money. Con is they're basically going to be forced to develop it. If I could, yes. actually, if you owned one of these lots and you never wanted to develop it, there is a very simple way to make sure your taxes now go up. Just put a conservation easement on it. And you continue to own it as private property, but you deed restrict it that it cannot be developed. So you'd have to go out and get an attorney or whatever in order to get that done and then get the land trust or someone else to take the word the town or whoever well, is handing could, these yeah, out. Yeah, <coughs> you would yeah. probably want a third party to hold it, but yeah. Or and give enforcement authority. So yes, it would be a one time cost. Fair enough. We 
moving on to page 88? I, th I think that's a fair thing to bring up, though, um, to consider in that. Could Go ahead. I get these are the things that I rely on. <laughs> Can't one say that it isn't going to be assessed as a lot until it's defined as a lot? I mean, you, you can put some, um, some sort of parameters around it that says, because they own this property and pay taxes on it. that would be all that would be in the evaluating. Yep. Exactly. Yep. 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 So, yep. so that's yeah. So I mean, it doesn't have to be. You know, be whether you grandfather right. the existing property owner, so it, it, you know, there's there's no reassessment on that until right. there's a transfer those kind or of guidelines. Like yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think those are yeah. all things that we could at the very least discuss, or you know, you know, as Chris points out, you know, there's an argument to be made for the revenue <laughs> opportunity there. Too. <laughs> so, um, you know, and some people. Some people are likely to uh, not want it, and there are others that might leap at it too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, th this is this is one thing. I know that there was a lot of at the at the particular public forum that I went to. There was a lot of discussion about it. That's a small sample size of people that were, I think, reacting to a, a broad, high-level concept. And so it's one of those things where as you get into the, mm -hmm. the devil in the details on it, you know, you, you start to understand what, what some of the impl implications right. and, and unintended consequences are. However, it's something that I, I would hope to continue to hear from people about to see what the public sentiment is right. as, as those details become available. Exactly. Chris? Uh, so I obviously don't support them, but as you noted, it does say evaluate. So I'd like to not see it in there, but it's not the end of the world if they are in there because it is evaluate. So. And uh, I mean, from what I've read up on this since this whole concept was introduced to, I, I see other communities considering this very same thing, particularly in their mature sections of town where, um, you know, these examples exist and it's a potential way to, you know, um, leverage the existing density uh, versus creating more sprawl. So. We've uh, considered it twice, I think, and rejected it twice. Uh, but at the same time, you can say the same thing about some other things that we recently <laughs> tackled. So <laughs> times change, but <laughs> yeah. That was nicely done. <laughs> Again, it's uh, I, I, this isn't the hill I'm going to fight my battle on, or whatever that saying is. Um, so I'm, I'm fine to move on with it as it is. Ready to go to page 88? <coughs> well, maybe most of us are on the computers. So the only thing different on page 88, and it's not highlighted in red because um, the table on the lower half was redone to add the column for medium home sales price, which was something that you had requested. It's so hard going back through these revisions and remembering what the heck we talked about when we asked for this stuff, I have to say. You and me both. Yeah. So other than that, the table's the same. Any questions on that? No. Going on to page uh, 109. Um, page 109 are the recommendations that you've changed in the municipal public facilities and services chapter. What page was that previously? So, um, 103. You, it's, it's, so you had a goal that the town shall maintain buildings and there was no change and then there was a town goal that the town shall assess the capacity of buildings and there was no change and then there was the modernize and the modernize are when you added a goal, excuse me, our recommendation to incorporate sustainable energy upgrades into municipal facility modernization. 
So, you know, that's a pretty significant, uh, basically is kind of creating a filter for your new projects that um, they need to start incorporating that new thinking, even if that new thinking might not be the, the least cost option. Uh, and then number 41 is a rewrite of the, of the recycling, and that was trying to capture um, what Councillor Garvin had asked for, but <coughs> obviously if I didn't get those words the way you want them, this is a good time to make some changes. totally small and not related to these things, but in this general vicinity of the section, um, under the Riverside Cemetery narrative, mm -hmm. um, was old page 101, line 35. This didn't know if we should initial cap Riverside Cemetery Committee. Oh, I can answer that. Maybe Councillor Jordan might want to answer it too. There was a very strong discussion by the committee about what was appropriate to capitalize, and there was a vote by the committee that town boards and town departments are not to be capitalized. But I mean, Riverside Cemetery is a place, so even if we're not capitalizing the C in committee. So when I say Riverside Memorial Cemetery, I can do that, but when I say the Riverside Cemetery Committee, um, I, I just want you to know I took a lot of capitalization out because I think all of those things oh, should be capitalized. I won't get into it. Don't, <laughs> don't go there. Like, oh, Fair enough. It's, it's essentially not a specific cemetery. It's referencing the cemetery so. by the Riverside, not the Riverside Cemetery. <laughs> okay. So are we ready to move on? Yep. To page 122. And this was the bonding item. And the change you made was actually, you know, made it a more concrete recommendation. And um, I, I'd like to say that I think it's most appropriate that the body that is in charge of deciding the municipal budget is the body that decides how specific this recommendation should be. So uh, the new number 41 says consider increasing bond and indebtedness and it also incorporates the idea that you should take advantage of favorable interest rates. <coughs> Natural resources goals. And uh, this was another time where the council decided that a little more affirmative recommendation should be made, where you talked about the town actually engaging in some discussion about pesticide use. Mm -hmm. Ready to move forward? Okay. Up to page 165. And this was the recommendation where the Harbors Committee had talked about getting an easement from the state of Maine, and Town Manager Sturgis suggested that a memorandum of understanding is probably the more doable instrument to acquire. So that's been added to the recommendation as an option. Yes. Do we want to add that also in um, the new number 59? Um, because it says the same thing. Oh, yes. Isn't it also mm -hmm. a memorandum of understanding there, too? Any 
anything else on that one? Okay, moving on to page 186. This was the recommendation about um, doing a more formalized, ooh, a more formalized uh, water quality testing. Um, where we recognize that maybe there might be some opportunities to partner with regional entities to do that work. So that's the new number 71. Not hearing anything. Can, before we move on from this section though, yep. can I, it didn't catch my eye when we had previously reviewed. <laughs> the last recommendation on this is about assigning names to significant unnamed water bodies and streams. Yes. I don't know if I missed the narrative that identified how many that is, or we, that's a there is situation. no narrative that talks about how okay. many there are. We the narrative talks the nar we're supposed to we're supposed to discuss in the narrative significant water bodies, streams, and even in the narrative we're talking about unnamed water bodies. What I was noticing is in the last comprehensive plan, water bodies that have been unnamed have since been named by the state. So I, th I think you can recognize that we have unnamed bodies now and that's sufficiently represented in the text. Um, I don't know how, I mean, we didn't try to do a, an inventory of all water bodies. We just looked at the significant ones and some of those aren't named. So I get, I, this is like a small detail, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. but in so much as a lot of the other recommendations are of the consider, evaluate, you know, mull over <laughs> kind of thing. This one is specifically saying to assign the names, and I, I'm not clear how we can fulfill that recommendation without knowing what we need to, what is lacking names now. Oh, I would say that um, you assign it to the Or is it our responsibility committee. to do that? No, or? You, can, you can take a, a different committee okay. and say you do it, and then they have to come up with the inventory as well as name them. Okay. And that's what we talked about last time, is having the Conservation Committee look at this and assign names. Okay, I don't remember the discussion, yeah. so. And this is and, a recommendation. And again, just specifically was figuring that there would have been something that said, here, you've got seven streams and four ponds that aren't named. How no, they, they, like I found a pond that I don't know why it got a name, except that maybe they named it after someone who worked there. So there's okay. names that got assigned that they're really, really tiny and they wouldn't normally rise to the level of getting named. That's why I'm okay. All right. Um, the next change is on page 219. Um, this is one of those times where um, there may not be enough poetry. <laughs> so there was um, a suggestion that there be a statement about Fort Williams Park that it has value to the community. It's not just um, an open space. And so one line was added that it has value to the community. So, so the, the sentence at the beginning of the policy from 1976, which uh, either way I'm fine with it, um, is Fort Williams is a unique community resource which has irreplaceable scenic, natural, and historic qualities. So that was, I don't know if that meets the poetry. I can just, I can just yeah. add that in. Yeah. And it's uh, under bullet 1.3 of the Fort Williams Master Plan Update of 2011 on page 11, I think, if you go looking for it. Mm -hmm. 
so I think that, you know, since open space was very highly valued by the community, it would make sense that you had to do some work to change this, chap this uh, recommendation. Goal number one has been adjusted so that it says the town shall maintain the current standard of 151 acres per 1,000 population of open space and continue its focus on open space management. And then, um, if you're okay with that, the recommendation number 76 is um, really bulked up to talk about continue to find unique opportunities. And I think, you know, bulking up this one section instead of trying to talk about the same thing in multiple different recommendations is the right way to go. But it says continue to find unique opportunities to preserve open space using methods including but not limited to annual contributions to the land acquisition fund, proceeds from land sales, general taxation, municipal bonding, and partnerships with other governmental and private entities. Municipal funding should not <coughs> be provided when preservation contradicts the town's land use policies such as location in a designated growth area unless the preservation is consistent with the town's greenbelt plan. So that's a new thought that you had uh, from the last meeting. Another one is when municipal funding is provided, preservation shall include appropriate and permanent guarantees of public access, which may be constrained to protect open space goals such as preservation of farmland and wildlife habitat. And that's a rewrite of the original recommendation. Um, still trying to get at that idea that when the town donates money for open space, there should be public access, but also recognizing that even public access can be limited. So the word constrained I use to mean that you can't totally exclude it, um, but there are good reasons to limit it. That was one of the, the ones that I, as I was reading this, and um, I think I understand the full intent, um, but uh, um, most of the farms are in the um, growth areas, correct? No. Not any longer? No. Almost okay. none of the farms are in the growth area. There's, uh, there's one or two that are, and the discussion that the town has had multiple times, every time we've reviewed growth areas, I think four times since I've been <coughs> here for the last five years, it, the decision has been that having a farm in a growth area is not necessarily a bad thing because growth areas have enhanced open space and clustering options. Mm -hmm. So you actually have a better chance of preserving portions of a farm if you're in a growth area. Mm -hmm. But most of the farms are not in growth areas. They are in the RA district. Okay, my next one was the word constrained seemed a little too soft um, because I think it can't um, encumber the opportunity to, I think constrained is going to be a word that people can take and really um, interpret in many different ways. And so I just didn't know if that was a uh, more um, uh, restrictive word because what I don't want to see happen is that uh, if there were farms that wanted to do development and they, uh, the development is adjacent to that uh, agricultural property uh, and that they wanted to have some uh, open space, uh, sell development rights or whatever, and the town contributed to those uh, selling of development rights, that then uh, one would um, have to fight the battle of saying, yeah, we want to do this, and yes, we'd love the town to participate, but no uh, uh, public access would really impact the business. So I didn't think that was quite direct enough. I'm, I'm welcome to direction. I mean, we're, we've got two things going here. I know. We have um, one thought being that if the town is contributing money to purchase of open space, the, town, the public's rights to that open space 
should be protected forever. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you can also recognize in our planning documents and in our ordinances that the public interest in preserving agriculture is, is truly representing those public rights. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can revise this a little bit more to talk about public interest when um, public access is constrained. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I think there's, I mean, this was the committee's uh, idea. Certainly, if the council wants to back away from it a little bit, you can. But the whole idea that when you put public money in, there ought to be a public benefit. There is a public benefit when you're growing food on that property. No argument. Okay. I've I, taken the hits for that. <laughs> Jeremy, um, I, I appreciate this, this edit and the committee's discussion um, on this when I wasn't able to be here last week. Um, I think the, the phrase that you guys were just using is really the key one, it is rather than requiring public access and then, it, I think if this, refer, if this refers to public benefits, mm -hmm. in, in my mind, and, and others may disagree with the hierarchy, but in my mind, you know, when the town invests in open space properties, I, I see that there are this reflects the hierarchy of public benefits that we are seeking to achieve with open space investments. Mm -hmm. Public access is clearly very important to a lot of residents. When it's not consistent, even, even if public access is not consistent with the open space that's being protected, though, there is a public benefit to the farmland and or wildlife preservation. Mm -hmm. So. I guess somehow restructuring this to reference public benefits and, and possibly including that hierarchy of, of public benefits. Um, That's a good suggestion, I like that. I'll work on it. Um, number 77. This was uh, another example of the council taking a recommendation and making it stronger and clearer. Uh, where you just came out and said, adopt a new Fort Williams master plan that prioritizes enjoyment by residents and balances the burden on the municipal taxpayers using methods such as, but not limited to, increasing revenues for non residents from non resident visitors. So the, the other thing is, this is a classic recommendation where it's very easy 10 years from now to say, Chuck, did you do it or not? <laughs> or 10 days from now. <laughs> okay. At least for part of it. Uh, so uh, for me, this is one of the highlights of the comprehensive plan because it's, for me, us putting a stake in the ground and finally um, adopting a position on this point. Um, and I just want to highlight the fact that we are, in fact, finally adopting a position. So it's not something we're necessarily stumbling into. This is a uh, decision we should be making uh, with open eyes that we are saying that uh, the master plan is going to prioritize enjoyment by residents. I just wanted to highlight that. So. I have a question about this one. This point is not entirely consistent with our vision statement. Um, I would be more comfortable if it, was a, if it tracked a little more closely with the vision statement. Um, because it seems very... I can go back and revise it. The vision statement that the council adopted is included in this chapter, word for word. And if you want me to revise this to more closely track that vision statement, I can do that. Is that general consensus? Well, I, I think it would be less of a clear and yeah. targeted yeah. recommendation because that was sort of where we wound up with vision statement. Yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, I, I'd be fine with that. I, I think that what follows from the adopt a new Fort William master plan is, is just a matter of consistency with the, the emphasis being to actually update and adopt the plan so that it's consistent with the vision statement that you're referencing. So, yeah. Ready to move on? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at page 240, and this is um, 
a this is adding text to um, <coughs> the body of the chapter based on recommendations that the council seems to be moving towards. So um, there have been recommendations in here about considering um, extending public sewer to existing compact neighborhoods, and there was a d discussion about the municipal investment and in the 75% that's in growth areas and the 25% that isn't. And so in the event that you do move ahead with some of that investment, it seemed appropriate to enhance what's already been said about the RA district to recognize that there are some compact neighborhoods in that district that are on septic systems that maybe it's time for them to upgrade. And that's what this language is doing. Um, we're talking about um, that public sewer lines typically are not gonna be extended into the RA district ex absent water quality concerns. So that gives you one exemption. And then under the type and intensity of uses, it talks about the district includes compact early to mid 1900s neighborhoods with lot sizes in the range to one quarter to one acre. And that's significant because the current minimum lot size in the RA district is two acres. So it really calls these neighborhoods out as being really you know, unique in terms of uh, the district overall. And that these neighborhoods are non-conforming to the RA district space and bulk standards. So it's just recognizing existing situations. Okay. Uh, the next one is page 241 where we talk about the same situation and if you're going to be making capital investments in these areas, and this doesn't commit you to making capital investments, but you kind of want the foundation in your plan if you do choose to do this. And again, it recognizes that you've got compact neighborhoods dating to the early 1900s. The replacement of aging infrastructure will be needed in these established neighborhoods. Upgrades to infrastructure may include extension of public sewer to protect the water quality of adjacent water bodies. Yes. And this is specifically Great Pond? Is that my I didn't say specifically Great Pond because <laughs> I'm trying to give you Fair more enough. flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. I think Great Pond, the, you know, the neighborhood around Great Pond is definitely number, showing up. It's the number one recommendation in the public facilities chapter for looking at potentially extending the public sewer. Okay. So uh, I'll rephrase that. So one example then of a district that would be encompassed by this would be uh, the area next to Great Pond so we could help improve the water quality of Great Pond. Yes. There are, I mean, ironically, there are other neighborhoods that meet the same zoning criteria that are next to the Atlantic Ocean, so that's why I went with the broader water bodies instead of specifically Great Pond. Are we okay with that? Um, on page 246, um, you, I think you know that we did send the Oh, um, we sent the future land use plan draft to the state because they will give you comments on the draft land use plan. And there were two comments that they made. One of them was, where's the BC district? Um, so it doesn't exist on the planet. It sits in the ordinance in case someone wants to apply for it. So we just added a statement in, in the chapter that says it's not on the plan at this time. Uh, the other question they asked was, what, what is this map? Um, and so we just added a little label to the special event facility map. Um, right here. Same map, label. And then we go to the um, recommendations in the future land use plan and we changed the supermajority charter change. Uh, this is something I hope the committee, the council will look at because I heard different things. And what this is basically is saying, maybe it's time for the town to undertake a, a housekeeping review of your charter period. So it, it kind of lifts it up a little bit and it talks about potentially looking at what the process would be if you're going to sell municipal property. 
So it, it doesn't require the supermajority. It just says maybe you need to look at it. I, I thought, don't take this personally, please. I thought that sounded a little fluffy, um, robust public engagement. It, it's like, what are we doing? Because the statement you just made is, do we want to do a town charter review? That's one thing. The other thing is, are we just reviewing certain elements of the town charter? Um, Great questions. So, <laughs> so that that's my kind of first point. My second point is, I truly believe through the process that we went through this past year or whatever, last year, that we identified how the council uh, would have to vote on the disposition of, of land or disposition of something. Um, and that I think that is uh, the solution to what the discussion was at the comprehensive plan meetings. Um, so that's another thing. So I think if we're saying do a review of the town charter and assess whether there's updates that need to be made, then okay, I can put that in here. But I think as it's stated here, I think we've already taken care of the problem that was highlighted. And, and I'm fine with, I mean, <coughs> You know, I was kind of morphing this into just kind of a generic, maybe mm -hmm. you should just look at your charter. I don't think there's been, I mean, it's a, it's a good government general housekeeping thing. I know you've gone in and, and adjusted little bits of it. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it's time to kind of just give it a look over and update it overall, which is not what this recommendation was originally. Exactly. I also know that Councillor Straw made some references to referendum votes, mm -hmm. and so I didn't put in specific referendum votes, that's where you get robust public engagement. Okay. But um, obviously this is, you know, this is what you, you should talk about and figure out what you want this to say and I will do what you want. Mm -hmm. Other folks have thoughts? Just calling back, my, my specific opposition to the language as it was previously presented had everything to do with the supermajority. I stood in opposition to, you know, the specific action that we did take. I'm, I'm just not comfortable with that as a notion here. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to not vote for the plan, but I, I just, I'm so uncomfortable with that um, selectively um, being applied to different uh, responsibilities of the council. I think if we want to do a charter review, we do a charter review. It doesn't have to be associated with land stuff. I'm not yeah, saying I, I want to do it. Yeah, it wasn't until you said that that I was conjoining those two things, though. So I was, I, I, maybe it's just then that this, this specific language needs to be finessed to make clear that the scope of. What do we do? The scope of what is being reviewed is anything in the charter that pertains to this, not a wholesale review of the charter. And so I, I, I can see how read the way it's written currently, that could be misinterpreted. So I don't I don't know if it's just a matter of tightening up the language so that it's it says more specific to the topic or not. But I, I, I still think we're talking about two, if not three different things all exactly. encompassed in, in this one recommendation here. Jeremy? Um, I, I, so I'm sensitive to your concerns around a supermajority, and uh, as well as as Chris's concept of, of uh, looking at refer public referendum or other um, ways to get public input when we're considering disposition of, of land in particular, probably real property generally. Um, I'm not. I, I'm also not. I, I s generally supported the intent of the the uh, citizen-led ordinance change that we made next year, last fall. But I'm not entirely satisfied with the specifics of the language that came down on that. So I think the value of having something in here for me is I would like to make sure that we give ourselves a placeholder <laughs> to go back. Um, and look at that language and make sure that we are 
you know, being responsive to the desires of the community to say, hey, we, we think, you know, selling land is something special and important, that the ta especially in public access, that the council should take seriously. I'm not ready yet to say exactly how I want to, um, to treat it. But I think that the concept of coming, you know, should it be super, you know, I don't know what the right solution is exactly, but I think the idea of coming back to it, ideally, you know, when we're not in the heat of a rife mm -hmm. argument and can have a, uh, you know, a good discussion, um, is a good one that I think we should hold in the plan. I just think. But isn't that a different statement? It's really saying that what we want to do is the council assess or um, the uh, um, the process for disposition of um, property. Yes. That's different than a charter review. It's saying yes. we want to assess how we the approach for it could, it could I mean a, a chart we could move toward a charter review. right but this is saying charter mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is let's go and let's look at how does the council what is the process and procedures for taking action on the disposition of town asset property yes. we, we recently made some changes that took that controversy off the table, but let's just go back and take a look at it yeah. and make sure that we made the I right like, changes. I like that. Um, Chris, uh, just, uh, exactly what Penny said. It's, and as Jeremy was basically noted, noting, um, we want to go back during a period of calm and tranquility in order to deal with something that is otherwise uh, rife with conflict potentially in any given situation. And if we can make the decision in a period of calm and tranquility, we're more likely to come to a uh, well-considered outcome. Uh, so whether that means revising the ordinance that we passed in some way, whether it means keeping everything as is, whether it means amending the charter, who knows what the eventual answer is, but it's, as I think, Penny said, basically, let's go back and figure out the right approach. Maybe it means amend the charter, maybe it means something else. But in, in specifically, if it was amending the charter, it would be, for me, Article 8, Section 2, and it was simply, currently we are required to have a referendum if we spend over a million, and I was simply saying, say, if we dispose of over a million, and just make that change so it applies either way with over a million, and then I call it a day. One thing I would say on any recommendation in this entire plan um, that I think, Penny, your initial comments shine light on is that we shouldn't be loosely making suggestions or recommendations about charter changes because if we're ever to go through the process of doing any change to the charter, it doesn't make sense to do it for very focused and specific things because it's a highly inefficient way when it's something that does have to be approved by the voters, say, oh, well, let's go just change and tweak this one little thing. We would want to undertake a full and comprehensive review of the entire charter. Um, many towns actually form a charter committee to do just that, just like we've sort of done here to come up with the update to the comp plan, so that you're putting a full slate of changes out before people all at once versus you know piecemeal. For uh, I feel too ill-informed to know. Have is there a list of things that are out there that we need to address, or is this kind of the only one that's hanging out there? In other words, does it make sense to say, "Oh, let's review the charter," or is it really just this at this point? I'm I'm not aware of any actual list. My guess is, if you were to do a review, a list would develop. <laughs> Do you know when it was last reviewed? I think there's been some tweaks. I'm looking at Deb. <laughs> you have to look. <coughs> is it data and on the front is, of it? I'm almost thinking yeah. the, the amount the of, um, yeah. that you keep in reserve, was that just a policy? No, it was the it was voting the, on a single yeah. item over a million, and yeah. there was a, a tweak to uh, um, deadline a, for um, nomination papers 60 days prior. Those were the, one the latest to, two in the last few one years. One of them was to bring it, the latter was just to bring it in conformance with something, right? Wasn't the, there a change that we 
Like we, we it, had to make stayed. that update. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah it's that changed wasn't, now. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that it used somebody to be just felt like, oh, we should do that. Right. Right? <laughs> That'd be a fairly esoteric thing. It was rational thing, right? to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was like it? Maureen says, I, you know, I'm not aware of a list, so to speak, that people are like, oh, we've got to start looking to that. Is the current one, was, is it 20, oh, why am I thinking that it was 2013? I'm just trying to find it online. November 6, 2012. 2012. 2012, yeah. 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 Before that, so far, or so. And so that was for that one piece. It wasn't a whole chart of review. They're not a full chart of review, no. Have we ever done a full chart of review? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there's been a couple. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I like what Jeremy mentioned and Maureen put up there. I, I mean, if we if we want to review the charter, I would support that, but I don't think that it's something we necessarily need in the comprehensive plan. The one tweak I might suggest is that rather than saying specifically consider adequacy of public engagement, something like specifically consider, um, I'm looking for that other language, but something along the lines of like the goal of maintaining access to public space or something like that. Because um, that's sort of what this grew out of. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be real property over a million dollars? Because what if it's, um, like we had talked the last time, what if it's a um, foreclosure or something? You don't want to have to. I, I don't know that I'm ready to go there. I, we could have an easement uh, or a very small piece of property that's only worth $10,000 but provides vital access to other open space. So I don't, I don't know that I'm ready to go there. But we're only committing to reviewing the process in any event. Okay. And as you mentioned that, I realize that's a good point, that the value amount, even if it's low, it might, we want some trigger potentially. Mm -hmm. So is this a new replacement number 84? I think this is specific enough for me to get us to do the review that we're only to do as part of implementing this plan. I think that if we don't somehow reference the um, the I don't want to get into the votes, but it's like if we don't go back and reference the fact that and I'm not into supermajority, that's not where I'm going. Um, some reference to it also. Um, specifically considers the uh, the balance of uh, council support or something. If we don't address that, people are going to think that we're going, okay, we're going to go review this and make sure it's done the way, the way we want it done and not necessarily the way that uh, we have been asked to do over the past several months. So I think we have to think about the uh, addressing the the balance or the input or something around uh, council's vote decision. Yeah, something along those lines. 
just so that people understand that we recognize that they want to make sure that we do have uh, the weight of the council members in a certain direction. Chris, in, a, um, in light of that, I'll simply note my, my view on any of these uh, very uh, controversial items or you're dealing with something of great import, I prefer to send it to the voters because people are more willing to accept the outcome of something decided at the ballot box than something decided by us as seven. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it, us as seven decide something, it can still cause significant strife in the community. Whereas if the 9,000 people in town instead say, this is how a majority of us feel, most people are gonna be willing to accept that. And at least that's, that's what I imagine. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'm wrong, but. So for that Good reason, point. for me, the, I, I do prefer, that's why I always kind of, uh, public referendum. So we don't want to put, what I hear you saying is we really don't want to put too much solution into this because that will evolve as we do the as we, assessment. Okay. Which has been the case I've realized with most of the country <laughs> that is that, that that's kind of been, ah, that's what we need here is less detail and more, like yeah. we, we, need, we work that out as okay. we go through it. Well, I just do don't want, I don't want. that great quote, I can't remember it. Uh, the, the thing about the pros and something else, but uh, <laughs> that keeps yeah. all of these. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I've, I've got, I mean, you don't have to commit to this language, but right now it's review the process for considering disposition of real municipal property and specifically consider adequacy of public engagement, preservation of public access to open space to favor retaining public ownership. Penny, does that address yeah. your concerns? I was also thinking we could also put adequacy of council support. But that may be just too much. Yeah, I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. Recommendation number 85 has been eliminated because it's been merged with a recommendation um, that's in the public facilities chapter regarding the electric vehicle charging station. Uh, the next change is on page 263. That's in the regional coordination goals. And uh, what we did is we just expanded the idea about partnering with other communities to um, add administrative services. So Couldn't get us to an even 90, could we? <laughs> and then we've seen page 298, I've already shown you that, okay? So that's the, the extent of the recommendations, but we still have more fun things to go. Uh, the next thing on here is the implementation and evaluation of recommendations, and that's that big chart I gave you. So, except for the changes you've made tonight, that should reflect your recommendations. And the main thing you need to be able to do with that is you need to assign priorities. Um, it also assigns who's responsible, and obviously you can approve that, but my guess is you're gonna be okay with leaving your, your staff to kind of help you decide who's responsible for what. You have authority to do all of it. Um, but the thing is, you need to establish recommendations under the state comprehensive plan rule. Uh, the last time I checked, you have about 89 recommendations and about half of them were designated as ongoing. So that means you're kind of <coughs> down to 45 recommendations. And uh, the committee did struggle with this idea that you really should be 
uh, designating some of them as high, some of them as medium, and some as low priority. And what that does is it gives some direction of when these things should be happening. It doesn't mean that something shouldn't happen, but if you, if you make them all high priority, um, either you're gonna be hiring more staff, which guessing that not gonna happen, or limited staff resources is going to make some things a lower priority without you having as much input into it. So you really should be willing to identify things that are the things you wanna work on in the next three years. And those should be your high priority things. Um, and then, you know, the low priority things that you're expecting to happen in year seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so, and I apologize, the formatting is a little rough on this because I was changing it at the last minute. Um, but high priority is in the first one to three years. Uh, medium priority is three to six years. A low priority is six to 10 years. So that doesn't mean it's not important. It just is a scheduling feature. I'm guessing that the number one uh, recommendation is a medium priority because you need to wait until the US Census is done and they start issuing data. Yes. Okay. It's just a zero missing from that too, 2020. Yep, I, like I said, I'll, I'll fix most of that. Yeah. So then evaluate trends, impacts, and opportunities arising from tourism, that's a high priority. General agreement on that. Mm -hmm. um, develop strategies to start and promote small businesses that serve residents and visitors. So that was identified as a medium priority. Continue to implement the Comp Town Center plan, that's, that's ongoing. Create a village green. That's actually happening. That that got approved last night. So Can I ask a quick question. Yes. On the I, I want to go back to the the sort of framework for the prioritization because the, the the I'm struggling with the year thing because something could be a lower priority and be managed concurrently but just not with the same emphasis or urgency. Um, it's, so as, as you went, um, strategies to start and promote small businesses that serve residents, I mean, that, I mean, so many of these could easily be ongoing as well. And if everything was ongoing and not prioritized, then how do you, how do you know what to do first? But um, I think of this more, in, rather than priority, it's more of a time frame. You know, but that's that's exactly yeah, what I'm struggling with, yeah. though. Is that I, I think rather than thinking, of, maybe rather than calling it high priority, we should be calling it near term, medium term, longer term. Well, I, we I'm, I'm that. suggesting the exact opposite. That they're all things that I mean, there may be some that literally are medium to long term, just because, you know, like the first one because we don't have the data, but. Um, there are others that something we should be working on now, not three to six years from now, but just not with the same amount of resources and emphasis as something that's a higher level priority. Does that so make sense? I, I hear you, and, and honestly, <coughs> the committee, they made, it, they made a lot of stuff high priority, and, and the other word you can use for these instead of recommendations is action steps. So if you think about them, which ones do we need to act on in the next three years? Because we can't act on all of them. Well, I, we just, I mean, the, the whole like strategize, I mean, what strategies are we going to start and promote? We gonna, what, what, when are we gonna develop strategies to start and promote small businesses? Um, well, I guess the, the other way I would, potentially address this or approach this is, you know, I've done other strategic planning work where you do the access of, you know, low effort, low return, high effort, high return, and, you, you know, within those quadrants, you start to pick off, okay, the things that are high return and low effort, let's bang those out right away. The things that are higher return but also involve a much higher degree of effort, then, you know, 
we're not going to build Rome in a, in a day there. So, right. Um, like I, I would rather almost plot them that way than it, it seems arbitrary to say on an example like we just gave about developing strategies to start and promote small businesses. Well, we're just not going to do that for three years just because it's not as important. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just... The methodology doesn't make sense to me. It feels very linear. We have to establish... Prior, I'm looking for the comprehensive plan I, I get section, it. and you don't need me to read that to you. Yep. You won't be happy with it. You have to establish priorities because you have 88 recommendations, and unless you have an 89th recommendation that says fund a huge consultant budget or hire four staff people, there's just no way all of these things are going to be done. So you've got to, you've got to kind of line the them up. The methodology that I'm just suggesting does not, does not say that everything gets done tomorrow, but it just, it, I, th I think, prioritizes things in a different way and allows for more concurrent activity. Yeah, yeah. It, it does. Yeah. My life I, is... I, honestly, yeah. I, I mean, I will put in here whatever you want me to put in here. I'm just telling you that when we send it up to the state, if we don't have priorities, maybe they'll be okay. <laughs> I don't know. Jamie, having done that methodology a number of times, in, um, I, I think it really helps you look at things and, and things... Everything doesn't get done, but it helps you create a, a, a Gantt chart of sorts so you can see how you're going to try to plot this out. And what may happen is something could occur during the period at, at which you were, um, you had thought um, you wanted a certain project to happen. Something else can come in and move that. Uh, I, I love those quadrants. It just, it, it makes so much sense. And you step back and you look at it and you go, okay, we might want to shift this, we might want to shift that. But it gives you that, that starter point. I think we as a team could do those quadrants. And we're not talking about eliminating priorities, right? Just a different way of getting to the priority. Exactly. We don't, we don't yes. want to do the, the years we'd rather do. I, I love that idea. That sounds... I do too. Like a great idea. It's basically adding a second column with this additional. It's factor. like it's so good. It really works. Well, even I mean, even if after that exercise you still have the H M L O exactly. for for mm -hmm. what the priority is, but it's the thing I'm really <coughs> hung up on is the timeline yep. because that suggests well this is not going to happen. When it could be something that, with you know, relatively small effort, could be done. It's just that because we're arbitrarily saying something that's a medium priority gets pushed out. I totally agree. Which is, I, I, I think, between you and Penny, I think you hit the nail on the head. So it's if we have the one column that's basically our prioritizing, which is just as this a high priority, medium, or low, and the other is a separate column saying um, when we're going to prioritize that uh, from a timeline perspective, near term, medium term, or long term. Between those two, we can then see what's high priority but long term, what's high priority short term. But it does require that analysis step that you were saying where we need to figure out which ones are those low hanging fruit. Yeah, I mean, an example, I'm not verbatim, you know, but like if, if we had cell phone coverage, cellular coverage, that's a high priority issue. Are we going to have a municipal cell tower in the next one to three years? Likely not. Maybe. maybe but I would say we're not. Well, or a built out micro cell network or something like that. I mean, that's, we yeah, that's probably a probably want to start it. That's a potentially like years out infrastructure project, right? right? It doesn't mean it's not a high priority. Right. And maybe this isn't the greatest example off of the list, but. You know, or there's something that's a low priority that it would seem insane to wait six to ten years to do, because we could knock it off in six months. But then you have to add the value proposition. Right, exactly, and that's that's what I think is missing: the the qualitative aspect of right. well, is this even worth doing right now? Right. Even if it's something right. that's easy, it might not be worth doing right so, now. So take the cell tower example, or the um, any any. 
type of related technology. What it says is that it's high priority, it's got a long timeline, but it doesn't mean, yes, yep. and it doesn't mean you don't want to start it. Mm -hmm. It means you understand yep. how long it's going to take. And so as you're running along that, that, that becomes your critical path, because it's your longest project, you go, oh, we can plug this in here because it is going to be, uh, I'm going to say, uh, high payback. Right. I mean, the other, thing, the other thing is a strategic exercise is at any given point, you should have the appropriate balance between the, you know, the big scale, high value, high effort projects. Exactly. You know, some that are in the middle, you know, and some that, that fall in that low value but low effort. You know, those need to be appropriately balanced out. Yeah. So. It's, it sounds like we all agree. Yeah. It's a great idea. How do we implement it? Do we need a workshop day to where we all sit down and do that and spend I, time doing this? I was actually going to step back and ask a question, a, a bigger question around plan implementation. So just because I, 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 and I think the approach that you guys are discussing sounds great. Um, I know some communities, when they wrap up a comprehensive plan, thank the committee that helped them develop it for their work and constitute an implementation committee. Um, I don't. I don't know that we necessarily want or need to do that here. Um, but I, I am curious what the mechanism is. You know, assuming we go through that exercise for looking at this plan and keeping us on track. Is, is there is there merit in? pulling together an implementation committee, whether it is a committee of this board or um, you know, perhaps a citizen committee to, to work through some of those questions and come up with more specific timelines and value, you know, value estimates, or is that something we think we can kind of work through as part of a process? And how do we hold, our, hold ourselves accountable for implementing in the way that we would like to? I think it's a good question. I think it turns on how many are assigned to us versus the uh, various subcommittees as we go through. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we can already basically say most of these belong with Conservation Committee, Fort Williams Committee, Recycling Committee, um, then we could handle it all ourselves. But if we realize that we have 60 items that all fall into the Town Council's lap, as Maureen noted, that's too much. Well, that was the other I, 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 not to throw a second monkey wrench into it, but I, I didn't know with, um, with all these different groups and representatives that are in the other columns. So we currently have it uh, with an X indicating basically whose job it is. I didn't know if there was any consideration to using more of the racy model of, you know, responsible, accountable, consulted, informed that kind of approach. Or and that might we might need to adapt that. It might not be exactly that, but you know, it could be, you know, you know, <coughs> who's got who's got the decision, which ultimately is going to be the council on almost everything. But then who is sort of the lead on doing the work? Mm -hmm. um, that might be another approach to take on that too. And and I think in some cases where there's multiple X's, that's what's that, that's intended to represent here. But to be more more clarative around. Um, you know, for this thing, you know, this, this is the, the sort of lead resource on this, but the decision gets made here. So anyway, but that, that's a second thing. Maureen, I think I interrupted you before you were gonna make a comment on the first thing that we were discussing about the prioritization. Well, no, you, you have <laughs> committed to holding a workshop in September. So my hope was that you would vote to adopt the plan, we would submit it to the state, um, they would get back to us before your workshop so that if there were any changes they wanted, we could process those pretty quickly. And then you could have this conversation, a meaningful conversation about how to implement the plan. Because the last plan, um, it was 
there was some discussion, but it was a little vague. And I think that's when you should be having a conversation. Do you have an implementation plan committee? Um, do you take these uh, recommendations and divide them up into groups? I think a lot of these recommendations are gonna require um, ad hoc committees that you, you assign them a task, they prepare the work and they bring it back to you. There may be other things here where it's really the council. So, but I was kind of hoping that that conversation would happen in September. Does the does the year do the years does the timeline have to be associated with this? For if, if we just submitted to the state and said this is a high priority, this is a medium, this is a low, is that sufficient, or is is the is the time? Component I think we need to define high, medium, and low. I mean, if you don't want to use it from a time perspective, I, I think we can, we might be able to fudge that. Um, they want you to establish priorities, and I think the reason they like that is because it, it is an aid towards implementation, and they don't want these plans to sit around. I'm happy to go back and reread the language of the state comprehensive plan rule, and I can provide you. Um, with specifics of that. What I would say then, it, um, even if we weren't doing the full quadrant chart on high value, high effort, all that kind of stuff, which really is more about actually executing these things and putting the recommendations into action, that you know maybe we define our priorities around, you know, priority one is something that, um, you know, there's a, high level of focus on, um, has a high degree of significance and importance to, you know, whatever, and so that makes it a priority one. A priority two is defined as such, and a priority three is, you know, on, on down the line. I, I, we I don't, don't know, I'm just, I'm just so, I, I just feel like the, 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 the linear manner in which this sort of says this is when you will do the things is completely contradictory to strategic planning. We don't have to use this yeah. chart. I mean, this chart has been around for a long time and for a lot of communities, it's an incredibly handy reference and a way to move things forward. But if it's not working for you, we don't have to use the chart. You, you have to establish priorities. We can, we can, you know, we can identify the priority in, in each chapter where the recommendation is stated. I'm, I, I like the chart. Um, but You're the I, only one. <laughs> no, you but and me. <laughs> but I completely agree with Jamie that, and I think he, like the, he's offered some phenomenal solutions on this, in the idea of basically decoupling uh, temporalness or the timing from the uh, importance is what just, the chart needs to be changed to encompass that. Yeah. It, also with the concept of there are, we can recognize um, the quadrants when there are ones that maybe they're low priority, but we can do them really, really fast and just knock them out and somehow encapsulating all that in the chart. But otherwise, I like having the chart. I would, I would, I'll, I'll use a good example that was something that was already brought up tonight, which was the assign the names to the water bodies, right? <laughs> I bet that's something that we could do in six months if we had to. Respectfully, no way. <laughs> I, I, but I mean, that has you know this much value and priority to the you know grades. I mean, that's well, just. But, but this, I'm, I mean, I'm making an exaggerated example, but I can tell you that that you, that is so simple that it was in the last comp plan and it still hasn't been done. <laughs> And it was, or it was a low priority thing that we got to <laughs> in ten years, and so it was like, oh, we didn't get to that. Yeah. Right, and you know, I I actually did look at the 2007 comp plan and did an evaluation, and you've got about 75 to 80 percent of it done, which is really very very good for any community. And it you know it is kind of like okay, you're getting down to the nub, and I mean there was a comp. I did have this conversation with people about do you want to do a new plan or do we want to finish the implementation. And the decision was to do a new plan, which is why the, the last 20% has, you know, we might have gotten to the water bodies, but. Uh. Remember the last 20% takes 80% of the time. Uh, anyway, um, what I was going to say is, number one, I do like the chart uh, because uh, it, 
it's nice to think categorizes, but I agree with Jamie that maybe we want a one, two, and a three, or and we define what one, two, and three is, if that's what the state needs. And you need a four for ongoing. Okay, four. Uh, ongoing is zero. Um, it could be a four. Um, and so if that's what the state needs, then let's define what those one, two, three, and four might be. But I do want to go through that exercise in September where we really start to lay this out. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that I don't think it's a committee we necessarily need to bring together in order to do that. We probably need representation from some uh, committees that already exist in order to go through an exercise. But in order to put these into quadrants, you can't, don't drill down too far because you're going to just get yourself into too much of the minutia. So for now, if what we need for the state is priorities, let's define what one, two, three, and four might be and let's assign them and then we can move on with how we sequence them. So I assume you don't want to do one, two, three, four definitions and assignment tonight. Um, no, I think that'll require more work to, to come up with definitions. Yeah. Um, because if you think about one, to your point, Jamie, one being it's high value, it, I mean, it, it is high value to the town. We heard it a lot that this is what the sidewalks, I, I mean, how many times did we hear sidewalks? That's something that's important to town. That would probably be a one. So if we take some of these that we know are uh, important, it can help us create that definition. If we take the water bodies one, um, we can put that as a three and it might get done someday. Um, and so we can come up with a definition, but I think we gotta develop the definitions based on some guess, examples. Are there, and I don't know if GP Cog would be a resource to have for this or other, other organizations. This is, but, this is what GP Cog has now. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if we can just go out and look for other examples that are not, are not time rooted, that's all. You know, the plan is supposed to be good for 10 years and, and you can't work on all 88 of them at once. Right. And the state wants you to say, generally how, what are you gonna start with, how are you gonna get it done? So, so what the state is looking for is not necessarily that value statement so much as the implementation planning, the scheduling the written implementation. Yes, implementation plan. So, and, I, I, would, I would suggest that if we, instead of looking at this as H being high value to the town, if we look at this as a first stab at when we think we might be able to get to some of these things, with the understanding that we're going to come back to it, and I, I, I think you know the, the model that Jamie suggested is, is a great exercise that we should do <coughs> in September and put some more meat around this. Looking through this, I mean, I, I think this looks like a really good first step. You know, the, the ongoing items are flagged as ongoing, and you know, I haven't I haven't looked at I've seen anything in here that that, I, that you have as a high priority that I or you know an immediate term thing that I said oh no that that we should really be doing ten years from now or vice versa. But is that gonna? Will that make sense, Maureen, then to, because the priority ranking may change after we sit down and do the implementation. Is that gonna be problematic in terms of state approval? No. If we, we can change the ranking afterwards? Right, I, I would say in any situation, you, you come up with a plan, you have your best of intentions, opportunities arise and you never want to tie your hands from being able to take advantage of opportunities. So you can write a plan and say that unnamed water bodies is a low priority and a, a, an intern walks in next year and says, hey, I'd like to work on this project for you. And you're like, okay, let's do it. 
So I'm, I'm just checking to see what the state expects here. Because, I mean, if we're actively planning to change the priority ranking, it just don't know if it would be disingenuous to submit it to the state and say, here's our priority ranking, and then plan our workshop in September to change it. I think the state would be happy to hear that you are already meeting to work on implementation. I don't mean to cherry pick this, and I, I, I'm just going with these. So, recommendation 65 is expand the mooring section posted on the town website to include information on current conditions, policies, links to mooring maps, et cetera, et cetera. As a medium priority thing, we're talking about making an update to a website that, with a with a time based prioritization, says, "Well, we'll do that in three to six years." I. I I fundamentally just don't understand. So let's change the definition. <coughs> just, just change it to H. <coughs> I mean, I, I'm comfortable if we want to just take some more time, go through the process of prioritizing based on need, and then come up with our timeline. That may be what we want to do, because it seems kind of silly to submit it to the state and then just come back and change it, which is clearly what we all want to do. Because you can have a high priority that has to be deferred in order for something else to occur. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it happens. Well, I, th I think it also just reinforces this idea that, and I get, you know, whether it be staff or resources or budget or whatever, that there, there are external and internal limitations on how you can do things and when you can do things, but it also just unfortunately reinforces the notion that we can't do more than, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. And I, I, I think if we, if we continue to reinforce that belief or reinforce that way of doing business, then we're not getting any better. Yep, I think we're all agreeing. Sorry, Maureen. I like the chart too, by the way. I don't want to lose the chart. I just want to do. I just want to. I just not. I guess I'll, I'll talk to you, Jamie, because okay. I'm just not sure where we are right now. I mean, no, I agree. I like the chart. I, no, and I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, with the with the calendar and time frame that we're working with, of how best to move it forward. So I think we can have separate discussion about that. We don't have to belabor it any further tonight, but. I appreciate everybody's indulgence of the conversation. I think the so only do we want to set that aside then? Well, uh, the only thing left is the executive summary, yep. and that's on page four. I was just thinking through this chart and the um, vision statement that we punted a little bit earlier um, and the 30-day public notice requirement for the plan. Do we have to have a final version of the plan available for review 30 days prior to our public hearing? You have to have it available 30 days prior to the July public hearing. Yes, we're, we're, we're doing, we're doubling up. So, so our, if, our if original plan was to have your final version available by next Wednesday. Okay. So, so if we're going to include this and or a revised vision statement prior to, so that we can have a public hearing in July, that all needs to be done by next Wednesday? What we had committed to 
was getting it all done by next Wednesday, May 29th, so that it would be available like a week and a half before your June public hearing. And then the clerk and I met and we looked at the state deadline and it said you had to notify people 30 days in advance. Your council practice is to not have a vote on a significant item the night of the public hearing. So you had already planned on having a potential vote at the July meeting. So the idea was that we'll leave everything in place. The only change would be that your July meeting would also be an officially noticed public hearing. So yeah, you can, I mean, you'll have to question how valuable your June public hearing is if you're leaving some of these pieces out. And certainly you would leave yourself somewhat vulnerable to criticism that that wasn't a real public hearing because you didn't have this stuff done. So as, as painful as it is, I think we should still try to stick to this goal of getting a complete draft by May 29th, hold your public hearing in June, and then you can still vote in July, and that will also be a public hearing. <coughs> the other option is we can just push everything back a month because, again, there's no, it's an arbitrary deadline we've created. There's no, like, pending requirement. We must have this done by September. Actually, it was a deadline you created because you did not want to hold a vote over the summer. So we could push it back to August or whatever. Uh, but that would be, I mean, I, it's not a problem for okay, me, okay. but that's a vote over the summer. Okay. I, I view June as, it's getting pretty close. But well, anyway. but yeah, yeah, we yeah, were, yeah. you know, you, if you hold your public hearing in June and you yeah. have basically a complete plan, you know, you meet your goals of having the public have an opportunity to testify before summer begins. So I think we could all argue that June 10th is before school gets out. People are usually still here. But this is what you had set up as a council. And if you want to change it, you can. Why can't we do something simple like, um, and I know Jamie and Maureen, you're talking about getting together or you're going to get together. But if if we just took the, time, the, the year's parameter off high, medium, and low, and, and um, that, because what I want to hear is from the citizens of what they consider high, medium, or low, or one, two, or three. Let's say high, medium, and low. And and if we look at high as some kind of qualitative statement that yes, this is important to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, uh, it's something that people uh, want and value. Medium being that this is something that I'd, I'd really like to have, but I, I, I put it a bit lower than. Um, uh, that the high importance and that low is, you know, that's nice to have, but I wouldn't put a lot of effort into it at this time, or I wouldn't uh, focus on it at this time. At least then we're getting feedback on where people are putting importance, and then we can take and morph that or use that when we meet in September. But. I, I think our objective at this point in time is really to hear from the citizens as to what they see as important. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that the integrity of the public hearing can be maintained with that clearly stated as what we're seeking for input. Yeah. Um, what the actual instrument looks like for doing that, I, I, I don't think if it winds up deviating uh -huh. I don't think that that strays from what you've, I think, clearly, um, you know, clearly articulated as the objective of understanding what people mm. place importance on. Um, frankly, even though we're talking about a more substantive overhaul to this, my bigger concern around the dates that we were just talking about is getting the language on the vision statement prepared yeah. uh, within that time. So right. I, I think I think this right. is harder work, but the the intent is clear, whereas the vision statement is just um, more of a time-sensitive exercise in order to have that complete and, and you know, really we're not going to be meeting again before that would be 
right. that, you know, that draft can get put into the document. So, so can I, yeah. just for clarification, so what I hear you saying is, and, and I agree, mm -hmm. the vision statement is the most important, so let's focus our efforts on getting that information to Jeremy. Number two, we can uh, maybe take the years parameter off this high, medium, and low and just give it some, some um, definitions, you know, simple definition. Maintain what these are right now that the committee put forward. Put that out to the, um, uh, for the public hearing because um, really it's the people we want to hear from in order for us to align this for the state, mm -hmm. so to speak. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Then I agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that means we're done with this. Correct? The moment. Yep. Until after the public hearing. The only thing that we need to make sure people are aware is that that the years we are, uh, I don't know, is it important that um, people understand that we aren't attributing years to the high, medium, low? We're attributing what's important to you. I thought you said you were gonna replace the years with qualitative statements. Some sort of statement. Yeah. Right. right. Okay, good, we're taking that away. Good. <coughs> Executive summary. So executive summary? Executive summary. Um, the key from the executive summary is that high level of satisfaction in the public opinion survey. So what it says is this is a steady as you go plan. Um, overall, the comprehensive plan recommends continuation of existing land use management and policies. Uh, the second paragraph is where we kind of say, but there may be some things that we do need to look at. And so probably if you're okay with the steady as you go, um, the second paragraph is where you want to focus on, but hey, the, this is where the key elements of this plan are. And um, affordable housing, tourism, school and municipal infrastructure, and efforts to moderate increases in the tax rate are called out as the key pieces. Just note on line 30, we now have 89 recommendations. Yeah. What's that? Yes, I noted that too. I've got it highlighted. I, I'm going to have to cook that number again. I have a super nitpicky comment. In, in the first sentence, there's no Oxford comma, and in the second sentence, there is an Oxford comma, <laughs> and I don't have a preference, but I just would like yes, them to be consistent. I prefer the Oxford comma. But, just, you know. So you want the comma gone after overall? Um, I want a comma after municipal infrastructure. Or I want to take away the comma before and or national or trends. we're in the second paragraph. Second yeah, paragraph. yeah. Better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I've bitten my tongue on this point, so <laughs> it's the, uh, my, my preference is anytime you have a series, if before the, the and for the last item on the series, always, always, always include a comma, but that's just my personal preference. It, it just makes me so happy when I see those, and I, I do my best not to point out. We had out a long conversation <laughs> about semicolons in the comprehensive plan committee yeah. meeting. <laughs> I like semicolons, too. So I did, did too. So did the people that wrote the vision statement, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a comment around punctuation because it's not my strong suit. 
um, what I, uh, in the second paragraph, uh, first sentence when it, it lists the um, uh, shifts in town policy include, um, if we're talking about uh, communication infrastructure, because one of the things that came through quite um, uh, loud and clear is that more and more people are working from home and um, in Cape Elizabeth, they, their businesses are in New York or wherever, and we need to be able to support that. I don't think that that municipal infrastructure um, captures that, unless that's referring to ordinances that would um, allow for expansion of uh, communication. This is supposed to be a summary of the recommendations that are in the plan. I know. And there's no recommendation in the plan to amend municipal ordinances for wireless infrastructure. Exactly. So there was one proposed, it was not accepted. But that is some, I didn't say that, I'm yep. I was just asking if that was intended to encompass that. So if it isn't, then somehow we need to say that town policy needs to um, address that need for uh, wireless infrastructure. I would just caution you that this is the way the vision statement went. I know. <laughs> I was there, I experienced it. It was only one little change, Maureen. Really. Honestly, Councillor Jordan, I think in, in an executive summary, municipal infrastructure could be an I, umbrella I, statement that means right. every bit of infrastructure in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And I would always say that wireless is a piece of the town's, that, the town of Cape Elizabeth, not the town ownership infrastructure. Right, that's what was my question. I think that's consistent with the current um, state and national dialogue too around Right. That was know. my that was my initial question. Are we assuming that it's underneath that? It's the assumption I made. I'll say that. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. So I, I took it out. Good. Okay. I, know, I don't think that people. I I, I think that the the vocabulary has shifted on this enough that people don't just think of infrastructure as buildings and roads anymore, but they think about it as. I uh, do too. And all that kind yeah. Of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. We just. I always like to define terms to ensure we were all speaking the same language with a comma. With a comma. <laughs> In the right place. Personally, I thought that the, the, those two, first two paragraphs did a good job of striking the balance that you've hit upon a couple of times tonight, Maureen, about you know this, there are no <coughs> radical changes in this, but there are things that you know do require attention, and I think that the, the right level of, I don't want to use the word alarm, but the, the, the right level of you know, spotlight is, is placed on those things. So, so I, I, I apologize, I uh, lost Penny's point because um, I was too busy scratching my head. Uh, it was the comma. <laughs> it was, that was the comma. It's uh, eat shoots and leaves is the example people use. Uh, Thirty-eight. Um, so there, there, I thought I thought someone said there wasn't a goal on uh, wireless telecommunication. I was like, wait, I thought there was one. So what was that? Because there is one. It's thirty-eight. Is how I interpreted it. Encompassed. Encompassed it. But I lost what your you point know, was. So. I believe what I said is there is no recommendation to change to municipal regulation. <coughs> There's definitely a recommendation that wireless infrastructure should be improved. Which I interpreted to encompass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on the executive summary? Okay. 
Any closing comments that you want to make, Maureen? Are there any other changes people want? It's still, a, my plan was to take all the changes that you have um, made and save them so the draft is now a new draft of the council. So there wouldn't be any more of the, of the red highlighting. It would become your draft. And I'm assuming everyone's good with that. Okay, so again, just to reiterate, um, back on the vision statement, um, get your thoughts to Jeremy as quickly as you can um, and appreciate you um, offering to do that. Um, Maureen, I'll, I'll connect with you about this and figure out what we wanna do exactly on that. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll have in our June meeting, uh, full public hearing um, to get uh, public input on this, and then sort of that secondary public hearing. Um, you know, not just for satisfying the deadline requirements, but I mean, I think that this is a big enough thing that, you know, people may come away from the first public meeting and say, okay, I've had a chance to think about that, and now this is what I think of additionally. So um, we don't do this very often, and I think it's good that we're giving it the due diligence that it, that it deserves. To that end, um, I want to thank you all. We've spent uh, upwards of nine and a half hours over the last three weeks um, just in this discussion, and I know that everybody's done a significant amount of homework outside of these meetings um, to be prepared to have good and thorough discussions here, which I think they've been, so I thank you all for that. Maureen, I really appreciate your time as well. Uh, it's well um, you know, outside of normal working hours for you. And so thank you for being here and enduring all of our commentary and, and whatnot. And then obviously, lastly, um, to reiterate the thanks to the committee um, and all of the different resources and stakeholders that were involved in um, getting us to the point we are today. Um, I can't emphasize enough how much of uh, a heavy lift this is. And, uh, you know, we had the easy part to sit here for just three nights and, and they had the hard work to, to, over the course of two years, um, pull all this together. So really grateful for all of that work and uh, continue to be appreciative of all the time and, and talent that was, um, uh, you know, given to the town for that. So if nobody has anything else, we'll call it a night. I, I just, oh, one, one more thing. Sorry. Yep. I, I just wanted to... Um, there was discussion earlier of setting a June workshop date. Is there any value in looking at dates now, or is that something you'd like to confer with now when it gets back? Um, I think we can. I think we can. If well, let's do two things. Number one, maybe here we can determine if there are known blockout dates. Yeah, and then Matt and staff can work on zeroing in. So we've got our meeting on the 10th. The idea was to have it after that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we have an election on the 11th, so I'm gonna, <coughs> that's a no-go. <laughs> yeah. So are we looking at the 19th, like a Wednesday or a Monday? I would say, that week of the 10th is probably my freest week. Yeah. The following week is one, two, three meetings. And then, and I have the... Does anybody have any, can't do it the 12th or the 13th? I can't do the 13th. Okay. I can do any of them. I can do 12th and 13th. 12th? 12th works for me. 12th? 12th. Okay, so let's have that as first, and then is, is the set week of the 17th just a complete no-go for you, Penny, or? Uh, I could do, uh, I could do a Monday or a Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday would be tough for me, but the 17th I could do Monday. 17th is good for me. 
works for me. Okay, so why don't we have the 12th or 17th as our first two choices, if we can make either of those work. Would the 17th work for you or not? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to go with a 6 p.m. or you want to go back to your regular time of 7? Um, it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. The idea of six was because we were figuring to go for so long for That's these, but I think you may want to go back to yeah, seven. probably. Do you want it on cable? On T on C? I don't think so. I don't think it needs to be. Okay. Do you? Is that, I don't know. I don't have, I don't have an opinion. I didn't hear that. Question about whether to televise. Have it televised or not? Yeah, I don't think no. so. Okay. I think at this point we're getting down into the weeds. Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.